<clears throat> Calling to order the municipality of Monroeville's Citizens Night and agenda setting meet meeting for April 4th, 2023. It is approximately 7 p.m. We'd all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Could I have a roll call, please? Mayor Greesock. Here. Mr. Hizzy. Here. Mr. Poach. Here. Mr. Stevenson. Here. Mr. Wolfram. Here. Mr. Adams. Here. Mr. Williams. Here. Mr. Biondo. Here. Mr. Little. Here. Mr. Ratcher. Here. Ms. Rock. Here. Mr. Hugis. Here. Mr. Sedlak. Here. Mr. Weldon. Here. Good evening, and thank you for attending. This is our monthly Citizens Night and agenda setting meeting. Tonight is not a voting meeting. Uh, the Citizens Night and agenda setting meeting is never a voting meeting. Our regular council meeting, which is the second Tuesday of the month, is when council votes on municipal items that we're covering tonight in the agenda. We have a public hearing for a zoning ordinance update and change. That hearing is this evening. However, it is not on the agenda to be voted on. It will not be voted on tonight. It will not be voted on at next week's April Council meeting. More often than, more than likely, it will not be voted on in, in May either. So this is a multi-step process, and the public hearing is a, is a big part of it, and we appreciate everyone for coming out here. We are going to be having a public hearing here shortly, like I mentioned, that we're residents and taxpayers, so these are, those are business owners and property owners, will have the opportunity to speak. And we are going to adhere to a five-minute time limit, as we do with all of our comment periods. It will be timed, and that's an effort for everyone to have enough time to get their comments in. And uh, we hope that everyone is, res is respectful of that time and allow individuals to make their full comments during that time period. If anyone would like to submit testimony for the public hearing as we move forward, uh, we're going to leave a window open until for 10 days. That would be next Friday, April 14th at the end of the business day. So if anyone that is here currently, anyone that's commenting tonight or plans to comment, or anyone from the community that would like to submit testimony, they would be able to do so. We'll have details on that on the municipal website, but we can do it through email or through uh, US mail, or you can certainly drop things off to the manager's attention. And that'll all go into, into, the, uh, into the record for the public hearing. Like I said, this is a multi-step process. We're not voting on it this month. There will also be multiple opportunities for residents to comment on the ordinance as it moves forward, as it gets closer to when we act on it, which may be for a few months. So if everyone understands that, thank you very much. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with our citizens' night. So this is not the public hearing, but if there's anyone that would like to uh, address council on any municipal item, now would be your chance to do so. If there's anyone signed in, um, they can come up now or if, if uh, or otherwise. <coughs> so we have someone that's signed in. Very good. Make sure you sign the appropriate <coughs> sheet up here for Citizens Night or the public hearing. Tim, I have the Citizens Night. Oh, you have the Citizens Well, that should be up there. And whenever you, in a moment after you sign in, after everyone signs in, we'll have you state your name for the record. Uh, you do not have to give your address, but you do have to state that you are a Monroeville yeah, resident. Do you want to talk at the Citizens Night or Public Hearing for the Zoning Ordinance? The Zoning Ordinance. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Tim. Tim. And we'll make sure everyone has plenty of time. And this is a public comment period. Uh, you can certainly uh, ask questions for the record. However, this is a comment period. My name is Doug Webster. I live on Penlier Drive in Monroeville. I know there's going to be a lot of heated rhetoric tonight, but I've got some good news for you. I'm reporting in my capacity as treasurer of the Friends of the Monroeville Public Library, I'm happy to report that our drive to help pay for the relighting of the library has been hugely successful. 
We've been able to pay for all the interior bulbs and labor. That's going to be a savings of thousands of dollars a year in energy and many more in labor costs because these bulbs don't have to be replaced 12 times as often uh, with the LEDs. And we raised enough money overall that we're going through the final figures now, but it looks like we're also going to be able to pay for exterior lighting, to pay for the bulbs for the, those exterior fixtures. So overall, we're very happy with the results, and I just wanted to report some good news to you. That was with the support of the Monroeville Foundation, the Monroeville Rotary, a major grant from the Monroeville Lions through their state foundation, private donors, and also numerous small donations of buy a bulb. So this has been a real community effort and a big success story. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lois Drumheller, Monroeville. I'd like to um, ask a question um, for consideration since I know it won't be addressed tonight, but um, I was noticing a very successful Comic-Con at the Monroeville Convention Center. I went Sunday, couldn't believe that all three days were attended so well, and many uh, exhibitor booths. And um, it occurred to me that I'm going to go back home and see whether or not we have a mercantile tax. That's part of the, you know, what we collect. Sure enough, it read that nothing had changed that way. And so I asked several people that were around in the exhibits whether or not anybody came at the end of the day, collected the gross sales receipt, because I understand the, that um, mercantile tax would be taken from that, and that's a source of revenue. Um, on Nobody need, seemed to know, um, and on my way out, I saw somebody with a suit that asked, oh, how did you enjoy? Of course we did. And um, I asked the, the administrative type person that same question, and they really could not answer that. So after that, I think I sent a letter to um, the liaison to the uh, uh, convention center. And it is still, uh, a rule that those gross sales tax receipts are tallied, is it not? I, you know, it's a yes or no, um, because that was a wonderful source of revenue for all of the people that attended all three days. And yet I don't know whether there was an accounting so that you could collect that tax. And I'm not, and I'm assuming that, that it's this way for all exhibitors that are at the convention center. So, not really able to answer it, are you? But I would like to see whether or not, maybe I could check in with my councilman uh, and see whether or not that's being collected because I certainly would hate for that not to be collected. What a great source it is. And I hope they have more Comic-Cons because they're the friendliest people. They all you know, go around and, and enjoy themselves. And I can't think of a, a less rowdy crowd and, and a more enjoyable thing. Hope you have more of it. Well, so I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. <clears throat> Georgiana Woodhall, uh, Monroeville. And I'd like to um, address an issue that is continuing <coughs> in my neighborhood. It's panhandling, and it needs to stop. You know, I'm calling the police a minimum of once a week from individuals um, that are on my property obstructing the flow of traffic and um, creating a hazardous situation. PennDOT, I want to thank PennDOT for getting the signs posted. There's at least three signs clearly posted on one part of our property and on the other Forbes part of the property and then on the island area. And there are signs that even if you don't speak English, you clearly understand it's a, it's a white sign with a person on it with a big red mark through it. Walking, no walking. So the other day I came home again and I pulled up at the intersection. I see a woman standing uh, on the Widewater property. And I can assure you, I've had any conversations with the Widewater uh, management in New York and, and in DeWitt, New York, and I can tell you that they have clearly posted the property there. No skateboarding. Uh, no solicitation, and they're soliciting, panhandling, right on the corner there. Um, 
I, and I, I don't know where else to go with this. You know, like I said, I'm calling the police. I understand you're hiring more police, but this needs to stop. I pulled up uh, and rolled down the window of, of the car, and the woman thought, I guess she thought I was going to give her money. And I asked, I said, uh, do you know that gentleman over there on my property? And sh she was hesitant. She said, oh, that's my brother. I said, well, your brother, I'm going to call the police as soon as I get home. And that's exactly what I did. I got my camera, I called the police, and I walked towards the property. And I noticed her get on the phone and call him on, on my lot over there. And then he proceeded to start to walk across the street when I was on the phone with this patch. I mean, this is absolutely unacceptable. And I know I asked about a month ago when that day, uh, day Dreamers and Achievers Academy was going to open. Does anybody know when they would be opening? Um, I'm sure it's going to be soon. And this has got to stop. This is not an atmosphere uh, to have children around. So I want to know, once again, um, where do I go? The police have been helpful, but there's not, enough, uh, there's not enough police here. Absolutely not. And this panhandling and all these intersections has to stop. These two people walked over the hill towards the Burger King that's hiring. There are at least a half a dozen stores hiring just in that plaza alone. There's absolutely no reason for somebody to be, uh, you know, as I said, obstructing traffic. And you know what? The one day I went over and I thought, I'm going to maybe tell them about the fact that there's been two people hit there and one person killed uh, a couple of years ago on Broadway and Coffee Street. But, you know, that. I'm reaching out to you and, and asking you one more time. You need to k speed up this process. We don't have enough police here. Thank you. Next speaker. Is there anyone that would like to address council for Citizens Night? This is, that's any municipal item. Seeing none, I'm going to close the Citizens Night meeting or that comment period for Citizens Night, and move over to our agenda setting meeting. And the first item is our public hearing. And we're going to start with, uh, this is the public hearing for the revised updated zoning ordinance. Paul Wielden, our planner and zoning officer, is going to start with an overview of, of the plan, of the ordinance. <laughs> Paul Wilton, zoning officer and community planner, and uh, John Trent from Strategic Solutions is actually going to start. He's going to tell everybody what Strategic Solutions did for the zoning ordinance update. <coughs> Do you just uh, you want to put you want to put the USB in? That's probably the easiest. Let me get this. I was going to walk through the document and. Uh, Pull out some examples to show you tonight. I don't know, you all got a copy, a hard copy of the ordinance, but I thought yeah. I might just pull it up as well, that same hard copy that you have as we walk through. Paul said, uh, I'm John Trent with Strategic Solutions. Apologize for the short delay there, but I thought it might be helpful if I had up on the screen as well as uh, a, the same document that you all got in hard copy format. Uh, we've been working with Paul over the last several months to advance the new updated zoning ordinance through the process. Over the last, uh, let's say, probably May or uh, June of last year, uh, we began reviewing the ordinance and working with Paul. I just wanted to give you some highlights of that process. Uh, we met with the Planning Commission four times. Uh, the first time was back in August, August 17th, then again in September, 
November and December. And during that review with the Planning Commission, we took input from the Planning Commission as well as focused on some of the items that we identified as we did an audit of the current zoning ordinance and identified some particularly hot topics. You know, zoning has lots of hot topics. Uh, there, are, there are some now that need to be added to your ordinance and updated in the ordinance. So we talked about those with the Planning Commission. We uh, proposed new draft language and work with Paul also to get the document in a, to a point where it's formatted and comprehensive so that it could be prepared for codification ultimately uh, if it were to be adopted by council. So as I said, I'm going to walk through and give you some highlights to give you an overall understanding of uh, what's in the, the, the new proposed ordinance. Uh, our role, again, was to support Paul as we went through this, zoom in on some key issues, and help with the overall package of preparing the document. Section 104 on page 5 uh, talks about the comprehensive plan and the growth management objectives for the municipality. Just wanted to point that out, that the zoning ordinance isn't uh, the comprehensive plan and vice versa, but those two things are related. The zoning ordinance is a legally enforceable document. The comprehensive plan is not. However, the comprehensive plan provides the overall guidance and objectives for the community, and the zoning ordinance is to implement those objectives. So I always like to remind communities that when you're working on your zoning ordinance, the comprehensive plan should go hand in hand, and those two things should mesh. On page 7 at section 105, there is a reference to the zoning map. <laughs> Paul's going to talk about some of the changes, proposed changes to the zoning map. Just want to point out that while the document that you have is a, obviously a text document, the map itself, I have 11 by 17 and Paul has some big copies, but you all received this updated, proposed updated zoning map. This map does go hand in hand with the zoning ordinances. Or zoning ordinance, the two things can't be separated. Uh, they are incorporate. this map is incorporated into the zoning ordinance itself. Article 2 is the definition section. We spent a lot of time here. It's important that the ordinance clearly define commonly used terms throughout the ordinances and even more importantly the uses that are permitted in the ordinance so that there's no ambiguity about what those uses are. Paul, as a zoning officer, is charged with interpreting the ordinance pursuant to the municipality's planning code, and the more definitions and the clarity with which terms are defined really help the zoning officer make sure that when a proposed use is presented, we can clearly identify what use that is based on the definitions of the zoning ordinance. So Article 2 is quite extensive, uh, and there are lots of definitions. I'm not going to go through all of them, but to pick out a few highlights, to show, uh, there's three uses that I'm going to highlight just to show how the, there's sort of a, a theme throughout the ordinance in terms of how it's organized. We want to define what the uses are. We want to identify where those uses are permitted, in which zoning, do, uh, zoning districts those uses are permitted and how they're permitted as a permit, uh, use by right, a special exception, a conditional use. And then thirdly, how is that use regulated in the sense of are there specific regulations attached to that particular use? So on page uh, 10, section 202, the definitions start. One of the definitions is food truck. You can see three, uh, quarter of the way down there. Uh, so a mobile kitchen that serves food beverages from an enclosed self-contained motorized vehicle or is towed by an operable motorized vehicle. I'm not going to read every definition, but just to point out, we also defined hobby farm as well as short-term rental. Short-term rental was one of the hot topics. Actually, all three of these were things that the Planning Commission was interested in uh, discussing and updating the proposed ordinance. So those terms, as well as many others, uh, including the term sign on page 55, uh, is now organized so that there are 20, no, sorry, 30 some <laughs> uh, sub-definitions of the term sign, just so that they're easy to find for folks. Uh, you go to the, on page 55, you find the term sign, and then every possible conceivable sign type is there with a clear definition. Article 3 begins the district regulations. So with, within or for each zoning district that's represented on the proposed zoning map, there are regulations that go with that, that zoning district. On page 73, at section 305, the residential districts are introduced. 
R1, R2, R3, and R4. Each of those has a clear purpose for that district, and that purpose guides what uses are permitted in that district and how they're regulated. On page 75 for the residential districts, the, at section 306, the area and bulk regulations for each of the residential districts. Continuing on page 76, section 307, the commercial districts are identified and defined. C1, C2, C3, and L special use. So there are four commercial districts. Those commercial districts on page 77 at section 308 also have defined bulk regulations uh, in a chart. <clears throat> Continuing in the Article 3 district regulations on page 77, section 309, the industrial districts, there's two of those. 78, uh -huh. Page 78, section 310, same as the other districts. These industrial districts have uh, bulk regulations, setbacks, height, etc. And then there's special zoning districts on page 78 at section 311 the S Conservancy, LF Landfill, and BLVD Boulevard. Those special zoning districts on page 79 at section 302 also have area and bulk regulations. So we define the terms, we define what the uses are, we identify the districts where they're going to, where, where they could go, and now the use chart which is quite extensive because it's got every use identified. It's section 320 on page 87. If anybody ever wants to know what use is permitted where, you turn to the use chart, you find the proposed use, which should be easy to identify based on the extensive list of def definitions. And this use chart tells you whether that use is permitted in the residential, commercial, industrial, or special districts, and how it's permitted. You'll see there are uh, not letters in each box for each use in each zoning district. An <coughs> N means it's not permitted, an <coughs> R means it's permitted by right, CU means it's permitted by conditional use, and SE means it's permitted by special exception. There are three ways that land uses can be permitted, the municipality's planning code which authorizes Monroeville to adopt a zoning ordinance and regulate land use allows for three different ways to regulate those land uses. Uses by right are approved outright by the zoning officer. Conditional uses require a public hearing. There are additional conditions that are attached to those uses, and those uses are approved by the elected officials. Special exceptions are similar to conditional uses in that there's a public hearing, and there are specific conditions enumerated in the ordinance that must be met, but those uses for approval go to the zoning hearing board instead of the elected officials. So the use chart tells you what use you can do where and how that use is permitted. As I said, a use by right, conditional use, or special exception. Article 4, beginning on page 904, talks about overlay districts. So in addition to the colors that you see on the zoning map, there are also several overlay districts in the current and proposed Monroeville zoning ordinance. At section 402, introduces the floodplain overlay district. All of the floodplain regulations were updated. That was one of the things we worked on with the municipal engineer and Paul and ourselves, merging the new proposed floodplain regulations into the zoning ordinance. That can have a ripple effect, so we wanted to make sure we were mindful about how that was inserted and made sure that it's consistent throughout the ordinance. So the floodplain regulations are now included, beginning on page 94 at section 401. Skipping ahead to page 118, section 410, is the next overlay, which is the landslide prone overlay. Page 119 at section 412 is the steep slope overlay. Section 414 on page 123 is the medical overlay, and Paul's going to talk about that one specifically. And then Article 4, uh, which begins on page 129, talks about that third step in the process that I mentioned. So we define the use, so what is it, where is it, and how is it permitted is the third step. And the how it's permitted starts <clears throat> on page 129 for conditional uses. And this section uh, identifies the process for the conditional use application and the requirements that need to be met. By way of example, if you turn to page 132 at section 504, 
begins with A, agricultural farm, and continues all the way through the alphabet soup of all the conditional uses. Specifically, if you pause on page 178 at KK, hobby farm. <coughs> hobby farm is a <coughs> use that's defined. I showed you the definition earlier. And here on this page 178 at section KK are all of the regulations that apply to hobby farm, which is permitted as a conditional use. So those regulations will be reviewed during the public hearing process that I mentioned is required for approval. I mentioned special exceptions as the third use type. On page 351, section 1211 introduces the special exceptions. A specific example, I highlighted in the definitions the short-term rentals, and on page 363, There are the regulations, the proposed regulations for short-term rentals. And this is one of those hot topics we spent a good bit of time talking with the Planning Commission about short-term <coughs> rentals, what they are, different use categories, how it's different than a bed and breakfast, how it's different than an apartment. Those are all and different than a hotel, obviously. Those are all different types of uses that need to be segregated, defined separately, and regulated separately. So page 363 has the regulations proposed for short-term rentals. Articles uh, 6 on page 235 is the PRD section. That's quite an extensive section. There's also at Article 7, planned non-residential development. And then if you skip ahead to Article 8 on page 263, supplemental regulations. So supplemental regulations would be for those uses that aren't special exceptions or conditional uses, sort of general provisions that apply to certain uses uh, to be approved and these conditions or these uh, requirements would be reviewed by the zoning officer during that review process for a zoning permit. That would include on page 262 at section 802 for accessory uses and structures. An example there at section 803 is for air conditioning systems and mechanical equipment. I mentioned food trucks in the definition section on page 270 section 810 are the requirements for food trucks. Article 11, which is skipping ahead to page 341, I want to point out there's an extensive section for non-conforming uses, structures, and lots. Uh, this is consistent with what's in your current ordinance as well. I always want to make sure and point out that with any change to any zoning ordinance, any existing use or structure that will be non-conforming with the new requirements has protections in terms of its future uh, existence and possible uh, expansion. Article 9 talks about the Zoning Hearing Board and their role as defined by the Municipalities Planning Code. Article 8 <coughs> is the Planning Commission and then Article 14, which is the final article, is Administration and Enforcement. And this is where it talks about the process for getting the zoning permit, the role of Paul as the zoning officer to review and approve permit applications. So this is an extensive hundreds of pages of, of a document, uh, lots of meetings <coughs> with the Planning Commission to review, lots of work with Paul and with Municipal Engineer to work on that floodplain stuff specifically. Just wanted to give you some highlights in terms of the overall structure and the specific items that are regulated in the document. I know it's not always exciting to look at the actual text, but it's an important ordinance for the community, so I often like to dive in at the last meeting just to make sure we're actually looking at the words on the page. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. So I think I'll just take this out. Yeah, you should be on hard. Okay. Take it off if you want. Okay. <coughs> So I was tasked with revising the zoning ordinance when I was first hired back in 2017. So I, I got started using a previous draft that was started in 2008. So it was a long time in the process and it got stalled multiple times. Uh, and even after I started it, it got stalled again with COVID. So we're finally getting close to the end here. Uh, John gave a, a really good presentation on a lot of the content. 
I'm just going to go into some of the history and some of the, uh, some of the uh, sections that we have in there. So our existing ordinance is from 1984 and hasn't really been updated since 1984, so it's very old, very outdated. There have been uh, dozens of amendments, and that's one of the reasons our current proposed ordinance is so thick. I took all of those amendments over the years and combined them into one document, so it kind of ballooned up pretty fast. It's not really that there's a lot of new information, it's just consolidating a lot of information over the decades. So the, in 2008, Lee Mueller was hired. He was sort of what John Trant's doing now. Uh, so they started, they got, uh, it got started. There were multiple reasons. There were different planning, uh, community planners and zoning offers that came and went and never got, uh, ne never got finished. So I had a lot of good information to get started with uh, and I used that as a road map and I just kept building upon it and I did a lot of research and added things in and then John helped me fill in a lot of things that uh, I had questions about. So this is our current zoning map. Uh, and a lot of the stuff stays the same. Some of the colors change a little bit. Uh, so like uh, in our commercial zone, that's all now becoming, instead of just C2, it's C3 and Boulevard, which permits mixed use. Uh, so that, 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 allo that allows for residential to be mixed in with commercial and retail. So you can see on the proposed map, the hatched areas are the areas that are going to be changed. Let me see if I can get this. <clears throat> so these areas are going to be changed in some form, either a zoning designation or some type of use by right or conditional use for special exception. And I just put some labels around just to give people an idea uh, to get oriented. So John mentioned all of the sections, and uh, we also, uh, let me back up there. So after we got so far in the ordinance, in the draft, we had to do the public notice, and we sent out over a 1,000 letters to the residents, and we also put up, uh, you know, several hundred of these orange signs on telephone poles. Paul, when was that done approximately, as far as the mailings and the poll posting? Uh, that was about two months ago. It's Okay. Um, a month before April 4th, a month, at least a month before today. Okay. So the mixed use I had already mentioned and John mentioned, uh, that's a combination of residential and commercial and retail. And one of the first examples we saw in the region was the homestead, uh, the waterfront. So they have apartment buildings on the outside of the development and then on the interior, they have uh, retail commercial. And then this is just like a bird's eye view to give an idea of what that looks like. You can see the, the townhomes and the commercial center. And there's just another image of street view, some of the townhomes. And then here in Monroeville, we already have something similar to that, Miracle Mile. It's, it's a strip center that's all retail and commercial, but to the south we have large high-rise apartment buildings and to the north we have a uh, single family. So in this bird's eye view you can see Miracle Mile and then you can see the multi-family residential to the south and the, the uh, single family residential is cut off on here but it's over, over on that side. So John mentioned we, we did, did expand the definitions quite a bit. I mean there's almost 100 pages of definitions now which is in our benefit because over the last five years that I've been here, I've been keeping track of how many developers would ask me, you know, a question and we didn't have something to address it in our current ordinance. So I had multiple pages of notes over the last several years of questions that were answered, were questions that were asked that I couldn't answer. So every one of those questions that I had that I couldn't answer, I made sure was put into the new ordinance. We expanded uh, the conditional uses and the special exceptions. John mentioned some of those. Uh, some of the other, other ones that we had uh, that caused problems were banquet halls. John mentioned bed and breakfast and short-term rentals. Chickens and hobby farms. I'm sure everybody knows somebody or seen chickens somewhere. Uh, so we, we, we en enhanced uh, the criteria for owning chickens. We're not against it, you know, but we've got to keep track of it because we've, we've had them running across uh, Monroeville Boulevard. So 
Uh, we've had some issues with those. Uh, casinos, uh, you know, there was a chance Monroeville was going to get a casino a number of years ago, so I put some criteria in there for that. Breweries, small breweries, uh, we see them popping up. There's one over off of Moya Industrial Park. You know, the small craft brews, uh, they, can, they can be made in people's homes, so we just added some criteria for those. Distribution centers, um, you know, Churchill went through a big battle with Amazon. I don't know that we'll have that type of a battle, but, uh, you know, it could happen. Monroeville's big. We got the big interchange out there with the Turnpike Parkway in 22. So we put a section in there and just have some, uh, some control over that if something like that would come along. <clears throat> Medical marijuana, uh, we now have at least three dispensaries in, in the municipality. We didn't have any criteria for that. We didn't have a definition for it, so we at least have some kind of coverage for that. Outdoor dining was a big hit during COVID. Uh, you know, I don't expect to see it to go away, uh, so we just got to make sure that the patrons are safe. Uh, you know, that's some kind of coverage. Cars aren't running into them. Um, oil and gas, uh, we had some, some stuff in the ordinance, but not a whole lot. I added sections in there for injection wells, compressor stations, uh, impoundments. Uh, shipping containers, I get a lot of requests for people that want to get a shipping container, turn it into a shed. So, you know, we can't really say no to that, but, you know, we're trying to dress it up a little bit and limit it. Uh, dependent dwellings, uh, you know, some people call them like mother-in-law suites or, you know, if your parents want to move in, you want to build an addition onto your house or a separate structure, you can now have a, uh, an accessory structure for dependent dwelling. Uh, so that's the... Mixed use. Uh, this particular place, this is Spectra Dolce. This is, uh, this used to be, a, I think it was AAA, and the Spectra Dolce was in there. And this is an example of the mixed use. Uh, the guy that owned the business on the bottom, he also was responsible for this area up top, but he couldn't use it for anything, and he wanted to turn it into an apartment, and our current zoning regulations don't permit that. So he was renting this whole building, but he was only using half of it. So that's one of the reasons we looked at the mixed use, so that if somebody has a space like that, they can rent it out in some, some fashion. Uh, again, mixed use at the mall. Uh, you know, the mall's been struggling a little bit and looking at Homestead and what they did down there. Uh, you know, we were thinking maybe some townhomes along the ring road might be a possibility in the future. Could be apartments. Uh, if something inside the mall would go away, it would give them the opportunity to, to maybe put condominiums inside the mall. Uh, you know, it already has all the utilities. Uh, it has a food court. It could be a kind of interesting architectural feature. You know, if you had a mall that had people living in it, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just an opportunity. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. We don't have all the answers. It just makes it a, a possibility. If CBL wanted to do something like that, it makes it easier for them. Uh, to go down that road and for some reason I lost a slide well that's unfortunate that that was supposed to be the the new VA uh, clinic and we anticipate that that's going to generate a lot of uh, good business for Monroeville they anticipate 400 to 600 patients a day uh, so that's going to be great for, you know, restaurants and businesses and hopefully for the mall. The, uh, let me go back to the map. So again, the mixed use is pretty much on the Route 22 corridor, Route 48 corridor, down 22 again and out 286. So currently that's all just zoned straight commercial. We're just giving more opportunities to those businesses if they wanted to incorporate apartments or some type of residential. All the existing commercial uses are still uh, permitted. Nobody's losing any rights to any commercial <coughs> businesses. We're just adding in residential. So the next overlay is the medical. So the medical overlay is is, uh, is also the Route 22 corridor and Route 48 corridor. And those are centered around uh, UPMC and AHN Forbes. 
Uh, we're fortunate to have two premier hospitals in one municipality. Uh, they both seem to be expanding, you know, every year, every other year they're doing something. And every time they want to expand, it's always a hassle for them. Uh, they need a variance or they need to do something special. So we're just trying to help them out, uh, facilitate their growth uh, by adding a medical overlay district. And again, the overlay district doesn't take away anybody's rights to the rights that they have on their property now. It just helps other businesses grow. So that's the medical overlay district. Uh, so you can see it down that corridor. Uh, this is where UPMC is. This is where AHN is. Uh, during COVID, Forbes had an agreement with the next tier people. This is the old Westinghouse property. And they had a shuttle and they used their parking lot uh, and they had a shuttle back and forth. So we may see some kind of partnership or collaboration between Forbes and the next tier people. So that overlay district will uh, help facilitate that. So this is Forbes Hospital. This is the next tier that I was just talking about. And this is the parking lots that they were using. And they had a shuttle that ran, ran a loop back there for them. And you can see the open space in between that has potential to be developed. Uh, Forbes recently purchased nor the North American Martyrs property. Uh, so that's part of that overlay district as well. Uh, we're not sure what's gonna happen there, uh, but it's, it's something that uh, it's on our radar and theirs. John mentioned the, the floodplain overlay district. Spent a lot of time on that. Uh, it's a lot of technical writing uh, and I, worked with uh, FEMA, Pima, and uh, Pennsylvania Municipal League, and we came up with a, a standard ordinance uh, that satisfies FEMA and Pima. So we'll, we'll be better protected if somebody tries to build within the floodplain, and that's the purpose of that section of the ordinance, to try to keep people from building in places they shouldn't be building. That storm we had, you know, three, four years ago in the summer, we had a big flood. Uh, you know, it's too late to stop something like that, but we can help uh, keep it from getting worse. And that's the purpose of the, uh, the floodplain overlay district and those regulations. Uh, oil and gas. So oil and gas has is, is recently become a hot topic. Uh, so we, we have some extensive regulations in our current draft uh, for fracking, deep wells, regular wells, uh, impoundments, compressor stations. And uh, some of the things that we, that we cover in our setbacks, uh, injection wells, impoundments, compressor stations. And this diagram, this is the proposed zoning map. And down here, I just have the different size setbacks that have been discussed. So the smallest one is a 500 foot diameter circle. So that's 1,000 feet from side to side. And that's the state requirement. That's all the state requires is 500 feet. Our current draft, we had 1,200 feet, uh, and in conversations, uh, we were thinking 1,200 was sort of random, uh, so we we're thinking about making it 1,500, which is three times the 500, three times the state minimum. But you can see how big that circle's getting. And then we've also had uh, residents mention a 2,500, 2,500 foot radius, which is a total of 5,000 foot <coughs> buffer. And you can see how big that circle is. What we have to be careful of is that we don't make our ordinance <coughs> exclusionary. So the 500 foot, it fits within our, our biggest M2 district. This is our heavy industrial district. So the 500 fits in there. So, you know, a deep well could go in there with a 500 foot radius. If we do the 1200, these areas become excluded and it, it would fit in the landfill uh, but there's, we, we've gotten a lot of uh, pushback on that. So I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And the 1500 also fits in there. Uh, the 2500 doesn't fit anywhere. So the problem with that is if we make our ordinance exclusionary, we could be sued and we could end up in court and a judge or the district attorney in another case can tell us where to put it. And we have no choice. We have no say in that. A judge could tell us to put it in all the districts. Uh, so we have, to, we have to allow for it somewhere, uh, and we just have to be careful where it goes. Um, 
So that's just a, a visual aid to give you an idea. And these are to scale, just uh, to help you visualize how big these setbacks are. So Paul, on that point, so once again, this is just the draft proposed ordinance, but currently, as our ordinance sits now, our current zoning ordinance, where is this activity permitted? Only in the M2 down here, and uh, these are known as like the rail yards. This, the white area in the center here is Pitcairn. Uh, this intersection right here is Sheets, Speedway, McDane's. That's the train tracks behind McDane's, and this is the big rail yard down below like McGill's. And those, those, the M2 zones haven't changed from our current to the Correct. proposed map. Correct. They, they same, didn't. same M2, same amount of M2, same size, same everything. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I maybe you should mention that. Uh, you know, we, we eliminated a couple of zoning districts. Uh, well, maybe not eliminated, but renamed them. The landfill used to be called S-1 Special Conservancy. And that confused a lot of people because we had S Conservancy and then we had this S-1 Special Conservancy. So the S-1 Special was eliminated and replaced with the LF uh, just so it wasn't similar. That way people, when they heard Conservancy, they didn't think of uh, parks and stuff. When uh, Landfill is completely separated from that now. It's still all the same regulations, it's just a different nomenclature. Uh, we did eliminate R5. It's going to get absorbed into the R4. So whatever was R5 simply becomes R4. All the standards, whatever was per permitted in R5 is still permitted in R4. We just eliminated R4 or R5. And we also eliminated R2-T, which was for townhomes. Uh, that gets incorporated into R3. So we're trying to streamline a few things. Uh, hopefully it's, it's, it's better uh, going forward. <coughs> And there, there's been a lot of controversy over how oil and gas got placed into the LF district. When I started working on this in 2018, I received a big box of information from Lee Mueller, previous zoning officers, and one of the items in there was this use table. And this is what I used to start my work. Uh, it was dated 2010. And it had oil and gas, and it had it as a conditional use in R1, a conditional use in M2, and a conditional use in the landfill. So there's been a lot of speculation about how it ended up in the landfill district in our current proposed ordinance. And it was simply just a previous draft that had it listed in there. And when I started, when I picked up that use table, I just carried it on. Nobody told me to put it in there. Nobody forced me to put it in there. It was just, it was already there, and I just kept working from it. And as the mayor said, it's a draft. I mean, it can be removed from there. It can be put somewhere else. We can regulate it some other way. But the only reason it shows up in the landfill district is because back in 2010, somebody else had it there. That's all it was. So once we got a draft uh, solidified, pretty well done, we sent it down to... ACED for their review uh, and we did get comments back they were actually very speedy in getting their comments back to us I was surprised they only had it for a couple weeks we got the comments back to us they were fairly uh, standard comments there were a lot of them uh, but most of them were uh, you know check with your, with your solicitor and make sure that this definition uh, is what you want it to mean yes can you tell the public what AC Sure. Allegheny County Economic Development. Thank you. Uh, that's a county organization, and they review all proposed ordinances. Uh, so it's, it's required to send it to them. So we sent it to them. They reviewed it as part of the MPC. Uh, so that's one of the boxes we have to check off. So we sent it down to them, got comments back. Uh, we've addressed all the comments. Uh, the ACED does not review specifics of like oil and gas or our bed and breakfast they just want to make sure that we have all the main categories that John went over like conditional use uh, planned residential development we have to have a section in the ordinance for zoning hearing board and planning commission there's there's general things in the, in the uh, MPC the municipal planning code that have to be in the zoning ordinance and the county just make sure that we have those boxes checked they don't look into whether or not, you know, a 15-foot side yard between homes is big enough. 
They don't suggest that you know it goes to 20 or 10. They don't look at the, the numbers in that detail. They just like to make sure that we have everything that's required in the MPC. So that's pretty much it. Uh, our current ordinance was under 100 pages. The proposed ordinance is over 400 pages. So there's a lot of new information in there. Uh, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of sections. Uh, some people think that the 400 pages is only on one topic. Not true. Uh, it's, it's everything that John and I talked about tonight. Uh, there's many sections in there. A lot, of, a lot of the pages are definitions. A lot of the other pages are the, the special exceptions and conditional use regulations. Uh, the oil and gas section is only, you know, 20 or 30 pages out of 400. So when people look at the document and they, and they hear about, you know, we have a new oil and gas ordinance that's up to be voted on, the oil and gas ordinance is not 400 pages. The whole ordinance in, in its entirety is 400 pages. And that's about it. So, Paul, if we could just circle back to the, the LF and the M2 as far as oil and gas exploration. So currently, as Monroeville's ordinance reads, from 2018, it's it's an M2, as you just mentioned. Correct. So, be specific. No, in the yeah, one thing. I, yeah, there's one thing I want to make a distinction of. We'll talk about a couple of different things. So, proposed ordinance, current ordinance. Current isn't the current proposed. When I say current, I mean what we currently have on the books, what our rules are. If we threw this all out the window, what our current rules are. So, in our current ordinance, it's M2. Correct. So in the proposed, based on what you mentioned about what was the work that you passed on from 2010, and that went through planning commissions and everything, um, so what, how, where is it in the proposed ordinance? You mentioned it's M2 landfill. M just go through that specifically so it's everyone knows where we're at. With it's it. a conditional use in three places, the M2 industrial, the LF landfill, and the S conservancy, which is all these uh, light green. As conditional use in all of them. Correct. And the conditions that we set forth, but also by the conditions that are set forth by the state. Correct. Yes. As well. Yep. And that's one of the challenges with, with this activity, which I don't believe there are many people in this room that are interested in this activity, but it's a, a thing that's permitted, or it's actually something that's mandated by the state. It's a state permitted use. So Monroeville has to have it somewhere in our ordinance. Uh, you know, whether you want it or not, and, and Mr. Wielden mentioned about that, we, we, we don't want to go down the road of having an exclusionary ordinance. Uh, that could be very bad for the community. Uh, we definitely don't want one that's unconstitutional. So that's what the balancing act is here. Uh, now, M2, I certainly understand, and landfill, I, I guess I understand the thought process. As far as conservancy, I'm not sure why previous uh, people working on this would have thought that would have been a good fit. Um, and I'm not sure where council is on, on, on that part of it. Uh, and this being the draft, I mean, I would like to see that be that part pulled out of the draft right out of the gate. I mean, I, as far as S Conservancy, that really covers, everyone looks at the map, that's a lot of green areas on the, um, on the map. And, and something to consider, the setbacks are measured from the center of, of these circles to the edge and it's not permitted, there are no protected structures to be permitted in this gray circle. A protected structure is any occupied structure. It could be a home, a business, uh, anything that's occupied. Uh, so even if we had, uh, even if it was permitted in the S Conservancy, chances are it wouldn't fit anywhere with the setback because you're not allowed to put one in within, you know, 1,200 feet or 500 feet of a home or something. So there, there's a lot of green areas, but a lot of those green areas would not work. Okay. But I'm not sure, I mean, I understand that part, but I, it, the opposite way of looking at it, I'm not, I don't know why we would want to even have that in conservancy to begin with. Sure. Even though, yeah, it may not possibly ever go there, <laughs> why would we even have that in our ordinance as a possibility, even though we would say, yeah, with our setbacks, it wouldn't fit. It, it might be because we already have uh, gas wells in conservancy. You know, they're, they're shallow wells, the shallow but wells. they're in conservancy, so 
That's probably okay. That's probably the genesis of it. Because our ordinance does not distinguish between a deep well and a shallow well. It's just oil and gas. So even if somebody, uh, Penico or whoever, wanted to drill a shallow well, conventional well, they would still have to meet these setbacks. There's no differentiation between a shallow well and a deep well. These are the setbacks for oil and gas. But they would still be, those wells would still be, there's not, they would be still pre-existing uses yeah, within that correct. district, yeah, even you, if we took it out of the district. Yeah, um, you couldn't make them plug it because we changed right. the ordinance. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it is a draft, as you mentioned. Uh, it's, and that's why we have these public hearings. That's why it's a draft. That's why it's not going to be voted on for a while. Uh, get public input. We can change this however you want. Understood. Council, does anyone have any, any comments or questions for Mr. Wilden at this point on anything that we went over or to Mr. Trent as well? Oh, I think he did a great job explaining. It's a lot. It is, <laughs> believe me, it is it's a, a lot. lot. And I also have the maps that I had in the PowerPoint. I also have on paper copies here on boards in case somebody wants to look at it in a different media. Uh, so I'll just leave these up here in case somebody wants to reference them. Okay. Um, but uh, that's pretty much it for me. Are we going to have an opportunity to ask questions at the end, or should we? I mean, I, I have a few, but I, I don't know if we wanted the public to speak first. That may generate more questions. Well, I mean, no, I think council, you have the opportunity to, to ask questions now, and then we'll have, after, after council has any comments or questions now, we'll open the floor to public comment. Once we get through as many people as, as we, we're going to get through everybody, don't get me wrong. But one thing we can do, this is a public hearing, and this is our agenda setting meeting. We have other business in the municipality. If we find that it's running on too long, we will continue to another meeting. Uh, but we definitely want to make sure everybody has, you know, ample opportunity to, to comment this evening. But we will watch the clock if it gets past uh, <coughs> people's bedtimes. We'll, we'll be careful of that. But, uh, but, no, I would encourage council. I would encourage council to make comments or questions now based on what you've already heard. But then I will actually allow, I'll, have, I'll open it for council to ask more questions after the public comment period. How about if I do the stuff that's not oil and gas now, and then we can let the public. The floor is yours, Mr. Right. Biondo. Uh, so uh, one of the things we have in here is uh, short-term rentals. Um, it's, on, I have it, it's on page 387, um, and I, I, I believe I asked the question to you, um, yeah. sent an email about it. Um, right now, er, in the draft ordinance, uh, there is a, the potential that we would have some type of fee for short-term rentals. Um, we also do also, we also do inspections um, of those. Is, are those yearly? We haven't. This is all new territory for us. Okay. We we don't have answers for all that yet. It's something I need to talk discuss with the building and engineering department and the inspectors. Because uh, right now we have we have some that are off the books. <laughs> okay. You know we find out about them. You know uh, accidentally somebody will mention to us, hey, there's a bed and breakfast over there, and it's like, well, they're not supposed to be one there. Uh, so we're trying to come up with some kind of a registry, and with that registry, there will be inspections and fee a fee schedule. Okay. And right now, are they do they get permitted every year? Like when you, like when you sell your house, you, the, the inspectors come through and make sure that they're all. Um, you know, right now, all it would be like a, a hotel, where okay. once a year it would be like a life safety inspection. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't necessarily go in and do an inspection as if you were selling your home, where they check every every outlet and you know all the different life uh, all those items. Uh, it would be like an annual inspection just to make sure that uh, they would have fire extinguisher or smoke alarm, something like that. Okay. And what's the chart, what's the fee for that inspection? I think it's $75. Okay. Cool. And that would be something we probably also could work into our annual budget during, yeah. the, during the fee schedule part of the annual budget. We can always go back and change that if we want to look at that fee. Yeah, I think it would have to be part of the fee schedule. I think all those, any fees that we have have to be incorporated into mm -hmm. that fee schedule. I mean, my, my thought on that, frankly, was just that if we're charging them for the inspection anyway, there's, you know, we should take that into account if we're going to uh, charge them to have the, the short-term rental to begin with. You know, you know, I, I, we don't want to overcharge or, or undercharge them, I suppose. Okay. Anyway. Um, You know, I'll save the rest for later. <laughs> Fine. There will be later, that's for sure. And, and once again, I keep repeating this. This is a multi-step uh, process here. Uh, council will, will have more opportunities to deliberate over this, to kind of get into these smaller issues that we want to dial in on. And certainly the public will also have opportunities to make comment about the ordinance as it moves through the process as well. 
So, uh, Council, any other questions or comments at this point? Seeing none, what we're going to do is we're going to open up for uh, the, the public comment period of the public hearing. Once again, this is for Monroeville taxpayers and uh, residents, so taxpayers being uh, property owners or uh, business owners. We're going to ask for a five-minute uh, time limit mm -hmm. when, you, uh, when you speak. And this is a comment period, so we want you know to keep your comments concise. Uh, once again, you can submit comments or testimony, rather, either via email or print over the next 10 days. We'll leave the, that window of the public hearing open for anyone in attendance here tonight, anyone that speaks tonight, or any resident or taxpayer that is just learning about this. They can submit comments and testimony to be included into the the final record of this public hearing. But once again, there will be multiple opportunities for residents and taxpayers to make comments on this item. Okay? So with, with that, I'm going to open the floor of anyone that's signed in. D Dave, you were front row there. Yeah. Shoulder got that. <laughs> All right, good evening. Uh, my name is David Mintz. I'm already signed in, long time Monroeville resident, uh, and I am currently raising my family here in Monroeville. Uh, and um, I'd like to uh, use my five minutes to give a little bit of background and make some comments. Um, one is that I hope, uh, unlike was uh, mentioned earlier, I hope this is not the last meeting, and I, and I suspect it won't be, but it was mentioned, you know, that this might be the last meeting, uh, in some earlier testimony by Strategic Solutions, but this is not going to be the last meeting, I hope, for the no. council and the public to make their, uh, uh, their opinions heard. Um, and I hope that during your uh, work session tonight, you do put on the agenda to, I don't know if that's the process for in your regular business meeting next Tuesday to vote to have further public hearings <laughs> after this one. So um, that's, uh, that's my comment on that, I'm hoping. Um, I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, back in October 2017, Sustainable Monroeville that I'm a member of, along with Food and Water Watch, worked with the council, the municipal manager, and the uh, mayor um, to uh, have the vote done by council. The council did vote uh, to uh, put oil and gas operations, that's all oil and gas operations, into the M2 industrial. Previous to that, the conditional use table allowed it in all zones of Monroeville. Um, three months later, in January of 2018, uh, an ordinance was proposed by council that was uh, researched and authored by uh, our municipal manager um, to move that to the current landfill zone. Uh, we objected. Um, after consideration, the Monroeville Council at the time unanimously voted to withdraw that, and so what it reverted back to was the October 17, where it is today, M2 Industrial. Um, now, as we said before, we don't really know the exact story. Uh, I mean, I, I appreciate Mr. Weldon's uh, 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 presentation tonight. Um, the people that worked on this earlier, that maybe he moved forward, it, whether they had it in the uh, they had it in the uh, landfill zone as well as the S Conservancy, and that got moved forward. But then we have good questions about that tonight as to why that would be moved forward now from people that maybe were working on it in 2010. Um, and those the two changes I want to talk about most tonight are the expanded landfill zone. So currently, as was mentioned, it's called S1 Conservancy. That's the zone the landfill is in. And if you look at the yeah, current map, which is not up there. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave, Dave, I'm sorry. Dave, get a forward, buddy. Forward here. Just sorry. so everybody can hear you. OK, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. If you look at the current zoning map, it's a much smaller zone than the proposed map. It, it's purple hashed, which is, I don't know if I'm on camera here. But this landfill zone uh, is proposed to be a much larger zone that contains our landfill than the current zone. So the landfill zone will be expanded, which brings a lot of issues, not only oil and gas, but all the other mm -hmm. issues that go along with uh, a landfill next to not only uh, many neighborhoods of Monroeville, but Pitcairn, which is a neighboring community. So we have Pitcairn residents here tonight, as well as council members and mayor. Um, so that expanded landfill. Hey, Dave, I'm just going to pause you for a second. Yes. You, I just want to move. Can you move that map so everybody can see it? So move it kind of towards yeah, me. I suggest that. And now move it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. There we go. And then if you want to point out what you were yes. just pointing out. So, so I was pointing knows. right here. This is the proposed landfill zone, which we were going to call LF to take away any confusion, LF landfill, making it obvious. But the, pre, the current one, as we speak today, unless uh, something changes, is only about this large and has green as conservancy all around it. Um, if you look at the current map, which is, I'm thinking Paul is coming up to show us that. Okay. Which is hard to tell, but if you've looked at this as much as we have, this is the current one. And if you go 
can you see me? And if you go all around, all of this area would be the new, considered uh, added to this, be part of the new LF landfill zone. So the new zone LF landfill would be much larger and uh, take away the buffer zones from the neighborhoods of Monrovo and Pitcairn. Um, and not only would it be expanded, but as we already discussed, um, however it happened and uh, it's in the proposed uh, ordinance, to allow not only uh, an M2 industrial to have oil and gas operations, industrial gas operations, fracking included, also in the landfill, also in all the S conservancy areas of Monroeville. As the mayor pointed out, um, that's a lot of the area of Monroeville, and uh, I can tell you over the many, many years that I've been dealing with this, um, I, some of the arguments I get is, don't worry, I canvassed the neighborhoods around the landfill recently, and one of the couples that answered the door recognized me and said, well, don't worry, it's not gonna happen anyway. My answer to that would be, well, if it's not gonna happen anyway, which some one, at least one council person told me, if, but don't worry, it's not gonna happen anyway, then why make it legal to allow it to happen if it's not gonna happen anyway? Why even have that in the proposal? Why change it if it's not gonna happen anyway? Um, who does it benefit? Does any resident of Monroeville benefit from this? I can tell you that the only one that I can think of that would benefit would be somebody who owns the leases, the gas leases, and that is Huntley & Huntley, now known as Olympus, which owns the gas leases uh, around and under the landfill, as well as some other areas of Monroeville that may well be under the conservancy zones that we have now. Um, now, saying don't worry, it won't happen, doesn't really cover that at all. That's not legal, that's not in writing, that's just sit down and be quiet. That doesn't make any sense at all to me. Now we're, what we're dealing with here is the health and property values of everybody that lives in Monroeville. The health... You can finish your thought, David. Oh geez, was that five minutes already? It's five minutes. Oh my gosh. Um, so I, all right, then I want to finish with uh, a question and a, and a point, okay, really quick. Okay, the question would be, I want to make sure the setbacks that we were talking about that aren't up there now, um, is that setback, because I think there was confusion in the proposed uh, ordinance, whether the setback is from the center of the well pad or the edge of the well pad. I think there's some confusion on what, where that would be. It's going to be measured from the well head. The well head. So that's the center? center. Okay. I would think so that's, it would be that's, center. that's less of a setback than if it was from the edge. Everybody understand that. Um, and I, would, I don't want to make sure everybody understands that um, those setbacks, like, like Paul even said, were arbitrary, not c considering science or the uh, the grand jury that was convened by our current governor when he was the attorney general, which proposed 2,500 feet or 2,000. But I want to make the point that the idea about exclusionary is really important. When we were making the change to, to put it in M2 Industrial in 2017, October 2017, we had talked extensively about something being exclusionary. And Mr. Ratcher talked to us about things being exclusionary, but you did not say that that was going to be exclusionary. <coughs> that passed. You didn't tell the council, advise them to not vote for it because it was going to be exclusionary. So as we speak today, over the last five and a half years, I, uh, there's no issues with us being exclusionary because we provide for a zone for this industrial use in our right. industrial zone. We provide for it. It's not exclusionary right now. Thank you, David. We, we have a lot of people want to speak. I know. And you have, all, you have more opportunity. If you want to write your comments right. out, you can submit them as well for the record. Absolutely. You made some good points. Okay. But you will definitely have more opportunities to yeah. speak about this. Thank I'm you so much. Trying to combine 10 years into five minutes. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I better get up now. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, I'm Tony Walker, and I live in uh, Ward 4. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for having this opportunity to speak and thank you for having future opportunities to speak. Um, okay, um, I know this has been said before but it's worth saying again that drilling and gas related ground activities are not good when they happen near where people live. Now my first comment is the proposed <laughs> drilling in green spaces and I'm not exactly sure if all, the if all the grass is green spaces. I don't, I don't really know what green spaces are. I know from looking at the map, but I'm not sure. But the green spaces I'm thinking about, I feel infringe upon where people have recreation and that drilling should not be done in green spaces. But then again, I'm not that knowledgeable. That's the first one. And, this, and my last comment would be that drilling in the landfill will endanger those who live in bordering Pitcairn <coughs> on one side 
and melon plan on the other side. And it just endangers the life of the children, you know, and poison and things like that. And, you know, why put people's health in jeopardy? Drill where it won't hurt the health of the living. And you all have great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. And I hope you use it wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Doug Webster. I live on Pendlier Drive here in Monroeville. And I want to thank you all for listening. I know it's not a thankful job that you engage in. I used to be a school board member, and it's a lot of hours and big responsibilities. I'd like to tailor my remarks to give a kind of a wider picture of the climate in which this decision is being made. And I'm going to submit to the clerk here uh, copies of some articles I've uh, printed out that address some of these issues, starting with global warming. Two from the Washington Post detail the recent findings of experts on global warming who say we have at best a decade to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and avoid the tipping point so severe we won't be able to adapt. Heat waves, famines, and infectious diseases that could claim literally millions of additional lives by century's end. <clears throat> Southwest Pennsylvania's history includes a century and a half of bad air days. It's a lot better than the heyday of the steel industry, but we still have got bad air. Steel mills and a coke plant continually exceed safe air quality levels. They pay state fines every year. It's pretty much pocket change for them. And they still get the bad air. The American Lung Association gives the region an F for air quality. Add to it a new Shell petrochemical plant built with the aid of over $600 million in Pennsylvania state tax breaks. Its license permits how much pollution it can emit each year. It's exceeded its annual allowance every month since it opened. America is riddled with hundreds of thousands of abandoned oil and gas wills, a massive source of methane that is the prime source of global warming. The state registry documents that we have 8,900 of those wells here in Pennsylvania, but researchers say that number is somewhere between 300 and 500 thousand. A Bloomberg article, oil and gas sites are a climate menace, cites studies finding that many marginal operating wells leak more natural gas than they produce. Ohio researchers found emissions were 21 percent of the production. In West Virginia and Pennsylvania, the rates were 9 to 18 percent. Science says only 3 percent of gas needs to escape to make it worse for the planet than coal. Well, you might ask, aren't the drillers capping those wills when they're done? Well, more recently, yes, but large numbers of those that are capped are still leaking. Others from earlier years aren't capped at all, and the costs of capping are expensive. It could be over $25,000 a well. Oil companies are supposed to bond for capping, but in reality, the initial driller captures the cream of the well's output, then sells it down the chain to a, uh, to a fly-by-night operator who disappears and nobody's responsible. We pay for it. The recently passed infrastructure bill includes $4.7 billion to cap orphaned wells nationwide. Those are your tax dollars. It's a lovely system. The oil and gas company privatizes the profits and socializes the costs. Can Monroeville effectively police drillers once they have permission to flack? Oil companies have lots of money and lots of lawyers and lobbyists. And those who argue that things are different these days should consider a Capital in Maine article from last year. Pennsylvania oil lobby keeps abandoned wells unplugged. And another from the Post-Gazette last May. Conventional oil and gas industry sues to be excluded from PA methane rules. Mm. Control of the oil and gas industry rests in Harrisburg. Control of Harrisburg rests in part with the oil and gas industry. At the very end of the last session, an amendment appeared into an innocuous bill. Legislators didn't see it until the morning of the vote. It was passed through both chambers in less than six hours in violation of the rules of both of those chambers. There were no hearings, no public input. It was negotiated behind closed doors by legislative leaders and the governor. And what it did was give corporate tax breaks to oil and gas industry heavily worth $2.6 billion. 
Will fracking in Monroeville benefit our community? Could produce some tax revenue, short term, but it will also produce a mountain of constituent calls to you demanding you to take action to stop erosion, stream pollution, noise, smells, and potential leaks. You have no power to do so. It all gets referred to the underfunded, understaffed, and overwhelmed PA Department of Environmental Protection. What will Monroeville have as a legacy? <laughs> Walk through Monroeville Park and look down into the ravines. You can see the tanks and the pipes from earlier drilling. Are we sure those are going to be cleaned up and we won't pay for it? If we allow wells here, somebody will profit, but when they're gone, we'll pay for it and we'll ask, was it worth it? I can't think of a real upside to expanding fracking here in our community. I urge this council to really study this issue and I'm glad to hear you're going to hold more hearings. There's zero reason to rush to a decision and I <coughs> hope that we will hear from real experts using certified vi verifiable evidence. But most of all, we need to know who thinks this change is needed and why <coughs> is it good for Monroeville? Thank you. Thank you. If you want to hand in that uh, paperwork. Next speaker. And just for everyone's uh, information, this, well, everything we're talking about, the proposed zoning map, the proposed zoning ordinance is available on the municipal website, monroeville.pa.us. There's also hard copies available at the library and at the municipal building. Um, thank you again, Council, for, for hearing us. And, and I live in Ward 7. And State your name for the record. My name is Deborah Coles. I live in Garden City. Hi, and, and thank you very much. And I, I also appreciate that you're going to be having some more meetings about this as well. Um, so um, I live near Glenwood Park. It's pretty much right across the street from me in the 800 block of Garden City. Um, the Thompson Run River is below Garden City, and it runs through Penn Hills, Monroeville, and empties into the Monongahela River, which already suffers from acid mine drainage but now faces the threat of carcinogens and chemicals that fracking companies have yet to release to the government. The majority of water treatment plants are not equipped to handle shell gas drilling waste and dangerous levels of bromide since have been found in drinking water. Also, not all facilities and drinking companies adhere to the DEP standards. For example, a company in Greene County in Pennsylvania, abandoned mine shafts, um, are pled guilty to 200 counts of dumping millions of gallons of Marcellus shale wastewater into abandoned mine shafts, local streams, and along roadsides. Plus the PA Oil and Gas Action Section 78, or Disposal of Brine, Drill Cuttings, and Residual Waste, prohibits the disposal of flowback water of any materials associated with the drilling industry into coal mines, slurry impoundments, coal mine discharge, or refuse piles. By detecting the co-presence co of coal waste and shale, but, but detecting the co-presence co of coal waste and shale gas can be difficult. And why that's important is Garden City was largely, <coughs> largely mined. It, it's it's a, a coal mining site, and that's, that is one of my major concerns. Professor Peter Stiles, a former president of Geological Society of London, states fracking near geological faults in former mines can trigger earthquakes. Faults too small to be identified on geological maps or seismic surveys were still big enough to cause an earthquake. The ground beneath Garden City looks like Swiss cheese. If you ever look at the map, due to over extensive mining. And many of my neighbors have had some, some, some mines and sons in houses. And I literally went door to door along the entire border. Most of my neighbors were very grateful and they <coughs> opened up the door and talked to me. And some had had some major mines and sons. Um, the the, there's a, this is also a conservation area where owls, red foxes, turkey, skunks, possum, and now the nearly extent, extinct bats live in, in and the species decline is readily apparent in areas that have fracking in it. Besides losing habitat in the suburbs, fracking brings heavy metals, salinity, radioactivity, and toxic chemicals to wildlife and the residents living near those areas. It also causes methane gases, releases toxic air pollutants, causing healthy people to have breathing problems like asthma, which I have so bad that I, I break ribs because I get bronchitis. Many of my neighbors, like me, have breathing problems, and studies have shown that uh, residents living near fracking <laughs> sites have an increase in cancer, hospitalizations, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. A Colorado study found exposure to air pollutants from fracking causes problems like neurological respiratory ailments and cancer, and if, if equipment breaks down, the hydraulic fracking can release sand into the air. And this has happened before, and the inhalation of sand causes permanent lung damage. Reported health effects from those living near sites cause insomnia, uh, weight gain, nausea, 
problems with the endocrine system. So I have hypothyroidism, it would cause people things like that. Leukemia. Um, insomnia is also very common because there's also constant 24 7. You have to keep this in mind if you're going to live near these fracking sites 24 7 light, noise, and sound, no matter what. 24 7. The fracking sites are too close to homes, schools, and parks where people meet and socialize. And I think that the idea of, of fracking in conservation areas and parks that are viable, that are viable sites for fracking is simply abhorrent. Um, we are concerned, my neighbors and I in Garden City and in, in Pitcairn, about our health issues, our homes, and our beautiful wildlife that we enjoy in our yards. The residents of Garden City are outraged that nobody informed us sooner. We demand more hearings and discuss more residents' concerns about, about this life-altering matter. Finally, it's disgraceful, I feel, how Monroeville chose to place large fracking sites around Pitcairn and increase the dump site near, near Pitcairn, which already accepts radioactive solid frac waste from outside of Monroeville. Thank you very much for hearing. Next speaker. And once again, if anyone, you know, you can hand in paperwork for the record. You don't have to do it right now. I know some people are reading from notes. If you want to hand those notes, if you're prepared enough to be handed in, you can certainly do that. Um, or you can certainly when you go home, email that same act exact document back into the municipality so we have for the record. But we do have a stenographer here, and we are recording these meetings as well. Cool. Can you just state your name for the record, please? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, Lindsay Dill, and I'm here representing Allegheny Land Trust. We're a land conservation nonprofit and property owner here in Monroeville. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we conserve 80 acres of S Conservancy zoned land south of Monroeville Park along Mossside Boulevard. Uh, we conserve land to improve quality of, li of life for future and current generations by preserving the community's scenic landscape, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, air and <coughs> watershed quality. Um, currently, we have an additional 124 acres under, contact, under contract for protection in Monroeville that would connect our existing conserved land, Monroeville Community Parks East and West, and Pitcairn's Sugar Camp Park to create 425 contiguous acres of green space for the greater benefit of the community. Uh, this land too is currently zoned as S Conservancy and would remain as such in the proposed zoning change. Um, in Monroeville's zoning ordinance document, uh, page 79, section 311, item A states that conservancy zoned areas are intended, and this is a direct quote, uh, intended to provide the conservation of open space and the preservation of environmentally sensitive areas throughout the municipality. Uh, in the proposed changes, <coughs> the zoning chart in the same document on page 88, section 320, shows that industrial activities su such as uh, injection well sites and energy facility sites could apply uh, as conditional uses of those S Conservancy zoned lands. We oppose that proposed change because industrial uses are completely incompatible with our conservation goals as Allegheny Land Trust uh, and also with Monroeville's conservancy zoning intentions as noted on page 79. Uh, we strongly believe this proposed change would negatively impact S conservancy lands, uh, be detrimental to the municipality as a whole, and potentially put our current 124 acre conservation project at risk. Uh, therefore, we request that you do not permit industrial activities in, uh, as conditional uses of these S Conservancy zoned lands. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't have any prepared remarks. My name is Chris Galanos. I emailed you earlier today and my council person are you signing Chris oh I am signed in great thank you okay and I'm a 38 year resident of Monroeville um, live on Hillside Avenue extension I have 2.2 acres all of it is zoned s conservancy um, as well as all the surrounding property um, of my house we overlook route 48 we're between route 48 and pick Karen and I can't imagine if fracking were to be allowed in that valley um, anywhere in the, in the S areas, even on the M1 
landfills, the amount of noise we here in our house is super insulated. Um, whenever trucks ro uh, have used their Drake, Jake brakes going down Route 48, it just echoes throughout the entire valley. Having an, an industrial applications allowed down on Route 48 and other areas of Monroeville is it's going to really devalue the land properties of our house up on in um, off of Grandview and Tilbrook, um, <coughs> as well as on Haymaker Road up go up the va up the valley and all those townhomes overlooking the area. Um, <coughs> our road's been closed down as almost as long as I've lived there. We did drive down Hillside Avenue extension to Route 48 a few times when we first. The road is officially still a public road, even though it's been closed down all this time. And um, if the land is bought by a company that wants to drill, they could force Monroeville to perhaps reopen the road. Um, and I've been told it would cost millions and millions of dollars to reopen the road and get it where it's even possible to travel the road because of all the damage. Um, a lot of our land is hillside. I really, really loved when I saw the Allegheny Land Trust buying um, the land and, and protecting it, having, having a trust. Um, let's see, I have friends that live, people that I work with in Pickharron, uh, below the landfill. Um, some of them are, are seniors that wouldn't be able to move, and I, I really urge council to think very, very carefully and, and hopefully oppose the al allowance of fracking in, in Monroeville. I don't care where it is, even in the M run zones. Um, it's not good. It's not good for my apple trees, for my dogs, my pets, my cats, um, and or any other people of Monroeville or Pick Karen. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sharon, are you doing okay? I'm okay right Thank now. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome. You are signed in. I am signed you in, yes. You can just state your name for the record. And uh, my name is Jamie Rudder Matkazich, and I am the second generation owner of J.A. Rudder Company mm -hmm. that uh, is located at 4917 Old William Penn Highway. Um, we are a wood waste recycling facility that manufactures landscape supplies from that wood. We sell to residents, contractors, and resellers. And while I've officially been working at the business full time since 1997, as the child of self-employed people, I can honestly say that I feel like that business is embedded in my DNA and it's a major passion of mine. My father started the business over 50 years ago prior to any zoning ordinance being enacted. So we've been functioning as a non-conforming use this entire time. Um, and because you're doing this zoning project, I thought it would be an appropriate time for me to request that the property that I own personally, as well as a, a piece of property that J.A. Rudder Company owns that's adjacent, be updated to reflect its actual use. Um, I met with Steve regarding this, as well as with Paul, um, and I shared with them some maps that I believe all of yeah, you we were, were given. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that I should put down here as I? Yeah, yeah absolutely, then everybody can okay. see it. So um, currently, the area that you see here, um, this particular piece of property is owned by me personally. Um, <coughs> this particular piece is owned by J.A. Rudder Company. And this particular piece is owned by me personally. And this little square, which may be hard to see, is my residence. Um, I'd like to propose that this main property um, be changed to an M1 use. The adjacent property that's owned by J.A. Rudder Company um, 
also to an M1 use, and then to subdivide this property. So if we jump to here, subdivide this property that I own partially to M1, and then the other part to R1, um, because that is where my residence is located. So the rezoning is important um, not only because it just puts us in conforming <coughs> use and, and it defines us by what we've been doing this entire time for over 50 years, but it's been an impediment for us as I've taken over the business and we're, we're growing and kind of channeling things more towards my personal passions. It has become a roadblock to lenders because we are a non-conforming use. Um, and it would be beneficial for me to have the portions that we own be reflective of what we do. Um, I know in the past there have been some concerns by neighbors that if we rezoned, we were just going to turn around and sell to Walmart. Um, and I'd like to just directly address that. I have no intentions of doing that. Um, I can assure you that is the furthest thing from my mind. I uprooted my family moved my family to the property um, because I intend to be there until my retirement. I turned 48 today, I'm not retiring anytime soon. So this is, I'm in it for the long haul. I'm in it to continue our good work of recycling, our good work of providing good employment to over a dozen families that most of which have been employed by us for over a decade and our our family to me. So I feel beholden to um, the legacy of my family's business to we're in it for the long haul. So I, I want to, wanted to preemptively address that because I know that was a previous concern. But I, I appreciate the consideration as you're making these changes that um, we could update my property to a conforming use and define it as what, what it has been. And if there's any questions along the way, uh, I'm happy to answer them as you consider this. This would also help you get bank loads, would it not, Jamie? Yes, yes. Um, I mentioned that earlier. It has been a question from lenders where, you know, as, as we're trying to get lending for future upgrades to equipment, um, site enhancements, things like that, it's been a question from lenders. Great. Thank you. We will definitely consider this. Thank you. And happy birthday. Oh. Sorry <laughs> to spend it here. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker. I'm assuming you are signed in, correct? I am signed in, Thank although you. it was on this form. Does it matter? <laughs> is it the, is that the? Citizens not. You want me to sign in again? If you don't mind, please sure. sign in. Yeah. No it problem. It was a little confusing there. Lois Drumheller, Monroeville. Um, usually goes spontaneously, but you know, I want to keep to my time limit here. Members of this municipal council have been given a draft of a proposed comprehensive zoning ordinance by, uh, I think it was by the latter part of January. Members of the, uh, uh, I've been, and actually during that time I've been asking questions as to whose idea it was to add parks and green buffer zones that are uh, conservation districts uh, or the expansion of our landfill to conduct oil and gas operations. I heard a uh, comment about that tonight. The status quo, was, which is what we have uh, by council's vote five years ago, moved oil and gas operations to an industrial zone called M2. Monroeville did right by pairing an industrial oil and gas operation 
with an industrial <coughs> zone. Uh, I ask council not to decrease the value that we place in our homes by allowing industrial operations 1,200 feet away. And I ask that we maintain the status quo that we have now with that uh, M2 zone being for oil and gas for the uh, parks that our families enjoy by not moving fracking and injection wells 1,200 feet from these places. Regardless of who suggested these changes for green spaces and landfills to allow for oil and gas operations, there is uh, no lawful need to move it there. We've made an industrial zone uh, as the status quo for this use over five years, as I said. No one can explain. Still, why the landfill has been expanded, no buffer zone on it uh, either. The proposed zoning ordinance and the map have been made available to the public for just 26 days since March, that would be since March 10th, uh, uh, before this one public hearing that's been advertised for tonight. So council must give more consideration than one public hearing for a 430 page document that changes land use. I ask this council, for a continuance of this hearing, providing uh, enough time for the public to comment after only seeing it for 26 days. Tonight, the public comment has been compressed also into a night where two separate meetings routinely occur, our <laughs> citizens night and the council work session yet to begin. This shows a very small respect for the constituents that have been standing for a long time here and uh, are out of all seven wards. In light of the substantive, uh, substantive changes recommended by Allegheny County, uh, a, a document that I have here, this is a recommendation that came back from Allegheny County, um, uh, an updated version of the proposed ordinance should be resent to the county for approval, and then once approved, a second hearing should be advertised. And I have reasons for saying that. Uh, what, we, what our planning commission usually does uh, in the process to update a zoning ordinance was changed about exactly a year ago when council voted to add a step to the planning commission's process by paying a consultant called strategic solutions to review and to rewrite this draft uh, i was there to personally witness um, in um, in i think november and december with our planning commission who was very new uh, with the exception of two members I witnessed Strategic Solution tell this commission that review of Monroeville's zoning uh, draft by Allegheny Planning Division that I've shown here was just a formality and that Monroeville didn't need a county review before <coughs> council voted. They made very light of it and then I objected to that at that same meeting. Now, I mean, this copy of my county uh, review, by the way, uh, has 16 pages of corrections and recommendations. Allegheny County pointed out corrections that needed to comply with the Pennsylvania's Municipal Planning Code and our comprehensive plan. Zoning law comes from the Police Powers Act to protect and to promote public health, safety, morals, and the general <coughs> welfare, and protects this by a due process, equal protection of residents for, uh, the, uh, of this community. Planning and zoning are regulated by the Pennsylvania MPC. Mayor Grisak has advised this council that in order to make public comment tonight, standing needs to be given only to residents and taxpayers, <coughs> property and or business owners of Monroeville. But according to another document here that I ran off, which is the latest version of the Municipal Planning Code, which I would hope every member of council keeps themselves abreast of because it's a complex document, as you know. Most people just pay attention to, you know, Article 6 on zoning, but there's more. And that is, uh, it's, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to have to finish this. You Article finish Section 502.1 of this document, of the MPC, isn't, um, it, it, that makes that not correct, what, what uh, you know, about that standing. <clears throat> it's true, you can set limits on public comment to residents, but they cannot deny standing from other board members of contiguous municipalities. And there are several who would do this. There are several here ready to do this. Section 502 recognizes that if changes in land use would negatively impact residents that live within one half mile, they have standing. 
That is the radius for standing in conditional use cases, regardless of the municipality they live in. If you're going to open up people to all the possibilities of the harms that come from this industry, you should at least be willing to hear them out. Finally, I'm going to ask Council to read another section of the Municipal Planning Code. In, section 11, in uh, Article 11, Section 1103A4, to put to rest a, a rumor uh, expressed by some who may not be as clear as to why oil and gas operations currently regulate, uh, relegated to our <coughs> industrial zone is asking, uh, it's just asking for a lawsuit. It, at where it is now does not result in exclusionary zoning. And you need to read that in order to really fully understand it. Monroeville, Thank you, Mrs. Drumheller. You can certainly. Monroeville voted Mrs. in 2018 to adopt a multi-municipal comprehensive plan, and it's called the Implemental uh, Comprehensive Plan for Chil Mrs. Churchill. Mrs. Drumheller, there's Churchill, a lot of people Churchill, Monroeville. Would like to speak please let me finish. I am just one sentence away. Everyone else at here. Churchill, to the time limits. Monroeville, and Wilkins Township have entered into this multi-municipal comprehensive plan, <clears throat> and. The 1103 of the MPC puts to rest this extraordinary <coughs> argument. Miller, you have the opportunity because to hand that Churchill in to the record. Because Churchill and Wilkins and, and Monroeville all provide for oil and gas development sentence. through their municipalities, we meet the legal criteria for oil and gas. There is nothing exclusionary in keeping it in the industrial zones. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Adam Gaynor, uh, nearly five-year resident of Monroeville, Ward 2. Uh, I appreciate everybody's well-prepared and uh, well-thought-out statements, and there's probably nothing that I can say that will give you more information about articles and uh, evidence and scientific studies that have shown that fracking is not good. Um, in fact, I think in a lot of this, what gets lost is the really simple details. and. Um, the one gentleman uh, mentioned it, but who exactly does this benefit? Is there a single one among you? Is there a single person in the audience here? Is there a single resident of Monroeville that actually will benefit from expanding the, the drilling and fracking areas or from expanding the uh, waste management site for that matter? Um, I know that the uh, council has kicked around ideas about uh, banning wildlife feeding and the impact of drilling, of fracking, of expanding industrial zones, of expanding <coughs> the, the uh, landfill is only going to chase wildlife into our neighborhoods more. Now you've heard from two residents who like the wildlife and they like their acreage without noise and people like to go out and hear the songbirds and see the squirrels or the deer. Um, that's only going to get worse. I mean neighborhoods being run through with deer and other animals is only going to get worse but the bottom line really is who does this help? And I would say nobody. So, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Good. Tom? Thomas Dick, Pick Heron Borough Council. Welcome. So now, and Tom's, so you're welcome here. And then that was mentioned earlier. So yes, if you are uh, representing Pitcairn Council as a whole, yep. you are certainly free to speak. Whether that's you designated by the council or the mayor, or if you were to bring your solicitor here, or someone representing. So if you want to fill that role for the council, I'm not sure if they've, if you've talked to the other council members. Yeah, sure. But, uh, but we're certainly welcome to have you speak on behalf it's of the very quick, I'll make it council. short and sweet. No, you're free to speak. Uh, I just want to get everybody, get everybody on the same page as uh, us here in Pitt Karen. That we hope that you seriously consider us down below the landfill. Um, we already deal with a lot of the effects as it is now without oil and gas drilling. Um, so us as Pitcairn, we want you to think of what further it could do with the expansion of the landfill and the areas around it. Right now on that map, there is that buffer zone of conservancy. Uh, we'd like to see that stay. Um, under the current proposed, there is no buffer zone and it comes right up to our borderline. 
And as everyone well know, Kenny Avenue and Wood Street are already experiencing effects from the landfill. So um, I just want to kind of make that known to, to council and uh, please keep us in mind down below you. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Uh, my name is Valerie Shaver. I live in um, Mellon. Pardon me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name. Valerie Shaver, S A J V E R. Yeah. So um, I plan to make my comments rather short. Um, but I'm here to make sure the, bar the borough is aware of my property on Hillside Road. Hillside Road is right down the hill from the landfill in the Mellon plant. <coughs> and the reason why. I want the borough to be aware about our homes is because our houses are fed by a cistern. The cistern is fed by an underground um, spring. And I'm also here because I don't think the borough was aware of this in 2007. In 2007, something happened that contaminated our water supply. Uh, the smell alone was so horrible it was overpowering. We could not use the water at all. Upon several calls to the borough, it appeared to be connected to a well that was being drilled up on 2nd Street. The liability was eventually acknowledged by Huntley and Huntley, and a water buffalo was brought in. After several weeks, the water eventually cleared, but the company's only reply was that they were not aware of our home and our reliance on an underground spring. With these news conversations coming about fracking being allowed near the landfill, which is located just uphill from my house, my concern is that something like this could happen again. I notified the mayor via email, and I believe you, yes, Council Hizzy. Mm -hmm. um, but I also contacted DEP, the South Southwest office. Um, he assured me that they make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted um, before issuing the permit to drill. But the municipality also has that same onus to bear as well. Um, I wrote about the pre-testing clause in the proposed draft. Um, so I'm asking the borough that if the borough would move forward with this new proposal, they, they're aware of not only my home but other homes, and that they require all our water to be tested prior to drilling um, by the landfill. And I just want to make sure, and I couldn't help myself, the borough remembered, like the who's down in Whoville, in Horton Here's the Who, that we are here, we are here, we are here. And one thing I didn't um, put in my little um, comments here, is I didn't, I guess, notice the change in the landfill size mm -hmm. because the one thing the uh, gentleman at DEP asked me she, was why would they drill in a landfill? Because the landfills generally have liners and drilling would defeat that purpose. So I think the first gentleman who spoke who pointed out the increase in the landfill zone now would probably answer that question, but it's something to keep in mind. But I thank you, thank you for your time you. and your consideration. I know I spoke once, Yeah, we only but, one, one time. But with regarding her situation, when I moved to Monroeville... Yeah, Chris, I know. We did not I know we have a lot of speakers. We have to... That's, we have, those are well, our rules. We, we want to stick we, to We them. did not have public sewage. Monroeville helped pay for us getting public sewage. Why wouldn't we do the same thing with, with the homes in the, her area, pay to give them public water? Next Why? speaker. Sharon, are you okay as far as... Yeah, five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay. And I'm just asking the sonographer for want, paper. So, and do you want to take a break? Yeah, if you want to do it now. Okay, we're going to take a, a five minute recess to get everything reset here. <coughs> but the public, it's going to be five to ten minutes, and the public hearing will continue. This meeting is back out of recess. It is approximately 9.04 p.m. So we, we went to recess during our leg legislative public hearing on the zoning ordinance. Uh, we do have other business in the municipality this evening, and I would like to move them around because those individuals are patiently waiting here, and uh, they have some family concerns. And so we are going to come back to the public hearing on the zoning ordinance, but we're going to move over to our new business. So council, we're going to move over to 23-2-SUB. Bowser Genesis of Monroeville. 
You can move. Applicant is requesting move preliminary and final subdivision approval to subdivide tax parcels 107H175 and 1244A-368 into two lots. Lot one with acreage of 15.072 acres and lot two with an acreage of 11.710. The properties are located at 1580 Golden Mile Highway in the C2 Business Commercial Zoning District. The Planning Commission recommends approval of this application. <coughs> You're representing the, app the applicant in your last month, so Correct. the floor yes. is yours. Uh, so my name is Lenny White, engineer with KU Resources. Um, this is the supplemental subdivision application to the uh, conditional use land development plan that we did <coughs> that we did last month. Um, you know, Bowser is. Where did my stage go? Uh, we're basically the point of this uh, this subdivision is to take its two existing lots right now. Uh, the lot lines uh, aren't exactly clear, uh, and actually the one lot is is through the existing uh, body shop. <coughs> um, so the two lots that we're doing uh, are going to kind of clean these lots up, uh, and we're going to split it uh, kind of by the uh, along Abers Creek, uh, follow the sanitary line to keep keep access to the line to both properties. Uh, and that is, that's really what we're doing. Um, total pro property, you know, it's a little under 27 acres. Uh, and we're proposing a 15 acre lot and a slightly less than 12 acre lot. Council, any questions for the applicant? <clears throat> no. Hearing none, this is not a voting meeting, but we're gonna consider this next Tuesday. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Next item. 23-2-C, Terry Smith, the applicant is requesting conditional use approval to operate a child care facility pursuant to Monroeville Zoning Ordinance number 1443 as amended section 401-.9. The property is located at 206 Monroe Street, tax parcel 743-E-003 in the C2 Business Commercial Zoning District. The Planning Commission recommends approval of this application. This is a public hearing process as well. The applicant is here. If there's anyone else that's going to add testimony for this public hearing regarding this, anyone in the audience? Seeing none. But miss, if, if you, I could just have you sworn in. So do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. If you just state your name for the record. Yes, Terry Smith. And if you just want to just go through your application. Yep, so I'm here um, to, I guess, request a approval, conditional use approval for in the C2 um, Business Commercial Zoning District. I'm over at two, 206 Monroe. Thank you. <laughs> I had one too. Over at 206 Monroe Street, um, right next to, what is it, uh, the burger place. Sorry, my, I'm drawing a blank here. That's okay, guys. so Jerry. Five guys. Five guys. There you go. Five guys, go and it. it's a small little street, and I don't know. It's, okay, here we are. So here's the um, proposed child care center. It sits privately by itself. Um, playground would be here. There's like a double door here that goes in the back. Um, this whole parking lot is for this space in particular. Um, so, yeah, I'm just here to propose to move into this location here. And what was that building used for before? I believe it was home health, from what I was told. It was um, several services. It was, uh, yeah, I was heard yeah. the last thing maybe to home health. Yeah, it was several. Okay. Um, but it's really cute and cozy, and I think it'll be really perfect for um, small children. I want to put six weeks to age five in this space here. How many? Um, I'm thinking based on the size between 60 and 70 children. Um, because there's a upstairs and downstairs, like a few steps downstairs. So it's a nice size little place, but um, for ratio purposes, based on the size, that's what I'm thinking. And you're going to be utilizing the entire building, right? Yes, that's correct. And do you, do you currently have a child care center? I do, last 10 years, over 10 years now. Okay, and then for people maybe that know or don't know, this is all regulated through the state as well. There's licenses yes, you have to get for you. Yes, your, I'm and, currently licensed, been licensed for the last 10 years. I'm looking to move into this space. Currently, I have six weeks to 12 years old, but here I want to have six weeks to five years old. Are you going to keep your old location or are you moving everything here? Um, mostly here. And then tomorrow I'm here for something else for another building. So there's eight, one age group here and another place, a different age group, which we'll talk about <coughs> at the next meetings. Did that Where's your current place? Um, right on Beatty Road. Okay. Yes. And did that uh, previous drawing, Jared, if you could go back to the drawing, please. 
You want to cross from CCAC? Yeah. I am. Yep. Yeah, okay. So okay. Yeah. Is, is that a proposed fence that's going to go around the facility? The red yeah. No, I believe um, this it's is just the showing the current space. That's, so that's the property line. I just outlined the property line. Great. Yeah, thanks, Paul. How many children would that be licensed for? Um, so I, I'm not the one who licenses. At the end of the day, the DHS is going to come and measure and license. But what I guesstimate between 60 and 70. That's just a guess. 60 and 70 kids. Mm -hmm. Currently, I'm licensed for 382 kids. Are you going <laughs> to fence it in? Um, so there's a fenced-in playground that will get up and move to this location that I currently have already. And nice. it's like a pretty, like it's a high wire fence. It's not like a smaller fence. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the, the fence line between there and the liquor store. The, the fence. So the playground will sit here. This is where so, uh, the back, back of the building back. is. And yes. then the playground will probably come out to about... This looks like a full parking space, maybe out to about here. And then a liquor store is over, I believe, here. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think the kids are going to go to the liquor store. but <laughs> that's, the, that's not the direction I'm worried about. It's Which, right behind uh, Pike Place. Yeah, right. Which, what is it behind? Pike Place, the shopping center there. Yeah, right. it's be northern, yeah. Yeah, northern Pike Place re renamed here. that. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be fenced in all the way around. Yeah. I'm not worried about the kids going that way. Oh, it <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I'm worried, you know, to, in the secure piece that, and it's a little bit of traffic that comes through there as well. And then you know, into the shop, into the shop, yes, ma'am, okay. into the shopping area, to the liquor store, to the five got to all that mm -hmm. space too. So if it was okay. Any other questions for the applicant? How many cars do you estimate that would be traveling uh, on Monroe Street? No, Monroe Street is a no, really I'm tiny, not. there's more, mainly homes it's up here, that. so you have to go down and then you have to bust like a sharp right. So it's not on like a busy road on Monroe exactly. The busier road would be leading to where you get to five guys. Monroe is a dead end. Yeah, Monroe. And then you have dead to end. make that left up on there, but there's three, four houses up on that top mm -hmm. part of the street. Yeah, it's yeah. like you can see the homes on this map. And a a business there, matter of fact. Almost like a U-turn coming from uh, CVS. Yeah. Yes. To get on that street. Yeah, yes. it, it's like I said, big U yep. there, mm -hmm. basically. Terry, I, I think he was you. asking, how much traffic is your business going to generate? Oh, how much is my business going to generate? Um, I mean, I currently have families, so my families are going to move from where I am now to this place, and then there's other apartments and homes nearby, so my hope <coughs> is we're Fox Hill Apartments and some of the other, I think, Monroe Apartments across. Um, my hope is that we can also get some of those families there. Okay. Council, any other questions for the applicant? So is there a motion to close the public hearing? Motion. 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 Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yep. So that public hearing is closed, and uh, and then we will consider this and vote on this at next Tuesday's meeting. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. All right, Council. Uh, we're going to move back to our the public hearing on the revised updated zoning ordinance. <clears throat> There still is a sign-up sheet. Uh, Ms. Woodall, I believe you were up before we took a recess. Yeah, I'm kind of here to set the record straight. Um, Maybe you state your name for the record, yeah, please. Yeah, Georgiana Woodhall. Thank you. And, and in front of me, I know, I know that Mr. Ratcher uh, was on the Zoning Revision Committee and worked on that, I believe, until 2009. And then Scott DeLute, he also worked on it. But I have a contract here, um, Resolution 0974. I submitted this to council in the past, and this is uh, Scott DeLute's contract. <coughs> and that was, uh, he was being paid at $75 an hour, and to, uh, he would be working an estimated number of hours <coughs> of work at 100 hours. I'm going to submit this, and also then in, March 8th of 2011, um, Lee Mueller was hired. And I was on the planning commission and, along with Mr. Williams, Mr. Biondo. And in 2015, we completed the zoning ordinance. And it was ready to go to council um, and go to the county for approval. And that never happened. 
And I know that Mr. Um, Wilden put in, uh, stated that he had been given by Mr. Mueller the zoning map. And that was in 2010, I believe. I wasn't directly given. Uh, I've, I've never talked to Lee Mueller. I just received a box. A box. Of, and of I believe that box that you received um, was a box that was given to Donna Meyer, who was a secretary at the time. Um, and that box was from, I believe, Ed Deal. Okay. Um, this is actually off your website at www.monroeville.pa.us docs, and it has the rest of the web address. And this is dated, uh, was given to me on February 13th of 2015. And on here, you'll see the landfill if you could zero in on this. Okay, let me see what we can do. And this is the zoning map that went along with that completed zoning ordinance in 2015. And if you look at this area of the landfill that, that you want to rezone, and you go up here to the future land use uh, key, that is landfill slash reclaimed recreation. That was to be a recreation area there. That was never to be uh, anything to do with drilling. So I, I'm going to submit all of this mm -hmm. to you. Um, and then now here we go to strategic solutions to the tune of $27,584. So if you add up all this money spent, honestly, it's a sin. I'll submit this um, to you, and I want to read to you an article. Um, I said before you should never let outside somebody outside our community come in here and tell us how we want to live or should live in our community or, or what we should have here. I know Lois asked a question. Her question wasn't answered as to who was behind it. Uh, same with Dave Mintz. And, you know, you may not have to answer that question, um, but I'm, I'm going to propose a question to you after I read this article. This article was from July 29th of 2010. Monroeville Company at the center of a deadly local gas well explosion. Monroeville based Huntley and Huntley is at the center of an Indiana Township gas well explosion Friday that killed two workers and ignited a fire that burned for 10 hours before being extinguished. At least three other workers were at the site when the explosion occurred, but they were not injured. Huntley and Huntley located at 4075 Monroeville Boulevard owns the shallow well which was produced, which has produced natural gas since it was drilled two years ago. The well is 3,500 feet deep. Huntley and Huntley President Keith Mangini said subcontractors were performing routine maintenance work on one of the two oil storage tanks at the site when the blast occurred. Humphrey said the workers had been welding. <coughs> Mangini said Huntley and Huntley was cooperating with the investigation, uh, including DEP and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. The company has more than 350 wells in the region. DEP has cited Huntley and Huntley for four violations since 1998. The company was cited twice but not fined in February of 2000 for failure to submit an annual production report. It was cited twice, fined 8,425 for unspecified violations in November of 1998. None of, it, none of its wells in Indiana Township received DEP permits prior to 2004. I can... Um, you can submit that for the record as I well, can, if I you can, wanted to. I can submit this, and I can submit this. But before I, before I stop, I'd like to ask if each one of you would be willing to state for the record... We're not going to do that, so you just finish up your comment ...that not period. you or any members of your family uh, will benefit from the changing of this ordinance. And I'd also like to just say, Mayor, if you give me another minute, we want to, we really have other people to no, speak. No, you don't have to answer to me, but sooner or later you will have to answer to God for anything you do that would harm this community or anybody in it. And I'd just like to read this to you. No, I, no, we're not going to do that. Your time is up. We'll have, oh, okay. We'll have multiple okay, well, I'll be back on Tuesday. You're welcome to come back be on back Tuesday. Be back on Tuesday. And we'll have the same um, five-minute time limit. And maybe and I should submit on this Sunday. on Tuesday. I've like, submitted it before, but... What's that? I've submitted this before. Um, if you wanted to go into this public hearing, I would encourage you to submit it now. 
Okay. You don't have I, to, but then you have until next Friday okay. to submit all that if you want right, to. Right, right. Thank you. Next speaker, any resident or taxpayer that would like to address council? Let me see that map. Is that map? I can't see the old one, I'll give it back to you. No, this is the one from 2015. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Okay. President. Thank you, Council Members. Good evening. My name is Deborah Morto. I live at 1253 Wall Avenue, and I am on Pitcairn Council. Um, I had a long speech. Yeah, so... We, but I'm not going to say it. Yeah, Mr. Dick was here earlier representing Pitcairn. I'm not sure if you were here at the time or not. I was here. Okay. I would just... May I just emphasize the little part that goes up Pitcairn Road that they want to, um, that's marked as con conservation land, would also roll up underneath <coughs> the part of fracking. And that is right below where you <coughs> installed that whole ball fields and the soccer fields up off of uh, Tilbrook. So I'm sure some of your children and grandchildren do play there. Um, I just really hope that you keep the residents in Pitcairn. Thank you. Um, and, and I thank you for your time. And thank happy you. Easter to thank all you. of you. Happy Easter. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. I'll leave the floor open. Hi. Hello. How are you? Welcome. If you state your name for the record, please. My name's Kimberly Klein, 595 6th Street. And I do live in Pitt, Karen. I know I'm not up here. Yeah, so. But I'm a resident, and I just want to no, say one. Well, you're not a resident of Monroeville. No. I'm a resident of uh, Pitt, Karen, my whole life. Correct. Yeah, this is for public comment for Monroeville and, taxpayers. Okay. Yeah. But if you want to email me your concerns, I know you certainly what you can. I said, but I really do believe that no, you but should this is let our, us this is our speak. Pub, this is our public forum. We follow the rules of the Sunshine Act laid for by Title, title 65 of the Pennsylvania Code. I get it. Code, and we want to follow all of that. So this is from Monroeville residents and taxpayers only. The one exception was the governing body of the adjacent, pro, of the adjacent community was able to speak. Uh, but other Pitcairn residents cannot, but I would encourage you, if you do have concerns, you can email them to me or Mr. Little, we'll make sure all of council has those concerns. Do you have Thank a you. card with an... Yep. Uh -huh. And he can email you. So I'll leave the floor <laughs> open for any Monroeville resident that would like to address council. But you are affecting us, <clears throat> residents, if you do this. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jeff Bastian, Monroeville resident. Um, hey, Jeff. I've pretty much lived in Monroeville my whole life. Uh, grew up in Garden City, moved away for about three years over to Shelfont, um, and now I'm living in Monroe Heights in Ward 1. So, um, you know, a lot of things have been covered. I'm happy to hear that this is the first of possibly many hearings on this, so um, that was one of the things I was going to ask. And I don't really think I need to go over really more of the ill effects that we know about fracking, and it's something we can discuss later. But um, what I do want to kind of keep in mind as we're going through this and, and crafting possible zones is just to kind of look at like the recent history of <coughs> even just our immediate area and the impacts that this type of industry has had here. So um, I remember in Boys Park, where our citizens regularly visit, sometimes every day, there was a mine fire that burned in there for 40 years that threatened the park structures and was even at risk to opening up sinkholes. Um, as a kid playing in the woods in Garden City, all back there, someone else had mentioned all the mines that are riddled through Garden City. I remember being told to stay out of the Orange Creeks because that was harmful mine runoff. Um, more recently, the strip mall on Northern Pike, where that liquor store is, um, was shut down for a long time because it was compromised by a mine underneath it. Uh, and it stood there for 50 years. No one ever thought anything was wrong with it, right? Until one day, it was suddenly unsafe. I don't know how much it costs to stabilize that land, but someone had to pay for that. So there was an economic loss to those businesses and also a tax revenue loss to the municipality because of these effects that happened years after the road, down the road, after the industry has already left. And no one can be held accountable for this. So it becomes the current community and property owners to take care of what's left behind. I use these. Um, I'm sorry. So, as I mentioned, I moved back to Monroeville a few years ago. And when we were looking at homes, we were looking in Monroeville, Murraysville, Penn Trafford. And we walked away from a few homes in those areas because the wells were so safe or so close to residential areas. And we didn't want to have our kids grow up next to that. 
we want them to be in a healthy, clean air, clean water environment. Um, we don't want to worry about losing our property value because it's something we couldn't control because of something that was happening nearby. Uh, we don't want to be stirred by loud noises and lights that are on. Like right now, I'm in that valley people are talking about by the sheets, and we hear that gun range going all the time. So I couldn't imagine what drilling would sound like echoing through that valley. Um, so I really think it's a competitive advantage for Monroeville to try to limit fracking as much as possible. Because I know it attracted me back to the municipality and made Monroeville trump Murraysville and Penn Trafford areas. Because I knew I didn't really have to worry about this. So this zoning is a little you know, concerning. So I hope these things are just taken into consideration. I think we can use it to our advantage to make Monroeville stronger. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll put it here. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Jillian Graber. Um, I am the executive director of a nonprofit called Protect PT. We have. Um, are you a Monroeville resident? I'm not, but we have this several members that are Monroeville residents. No, sorry, okay. but you can submit. Um, I would like to submit my, my comment then. You can submit that absolutely, okay. but uh, but yes, yeah, so this is for public comment for residents only okay, should and I taxpayers. Give it to the to the sonographer is fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I'll leave the floor open for any Monroeville resident that would like to address council on this zoning ordinance, the proposed draft of the zoning ordinance. Seeing none, we're going to close that public hearing. Once again, this is in draft form. There is uh, there's a lot of content of this, of this item. I think we've had uh, really good comments from the public. And I just want to commend the public, you know, for the, the large size that we had, the attendance we had, and the overwhelmingly uh, respectful demeanor of all the speakers, for the most part, did a really good job. And I just want to thank you because we all want to work together here. It's a very important document. Uh, it's been going on since 2008, multiple revisions. It really is important for Monroeville. Uh, yes, the, the item of drilling has... Um, has, is a small part of it. It's an important part, uh, but there is a, a, this is a large document. We want to get it right. Appreciate everyone's input on this, and there will be multiple opportunities to, for the public to comment as we move forward through this process. Once again, we are not voting on this ordinance this evening. We are not, it is not on the agenda. We're not voting on it at next Tuesday's meeting. Um, and then in, there are multiple steps we have to go through. This will all be advertised. If anyone is interested, once again, it is available on the municipal website. It is also, there are physical copies available at the municipal building and at the Mineral Public Library. I would encourage you to reach out to your council people, my office, Mr. Little, and then lastly, the public hearing we had this evening. Anyone that would like to address uh, or add testimony to that in written form can do so. We'll have the details on the municipal website. Uh, if you're here right now, Mr. Little has his business card as far as has his email address, and uh, you can submit testimony, and that is whether you spoke tonight or not, uh, but any municipal resident can do that for 10 days up until next Friday. That's Friday the 14th uh, by the end of the workday on the 14th, 4.30 p.m. Uh, we are open here 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Uh, if you come to the front desk, uh, the receptionist will, will know what you're talking about if you want to hand in paperwork. That was a question I had earlier. And, uh, and certainly reach out to, uh, to me or your council, council person. So with that, council, let's uh, move through the rest of our agenda setting meeting. I have an executive session announcement that council conducted an executive session before tonight's Citizens Night meeting on Tuesday, April 4th from 6.15 p.m. to approximately 7 p.m. for personnel and litigation reasons. Council legislative action, if any, shall be taking, taken at the Tuesday, next Tuesday, April 11th, council meeting. Council minutes for your approval for next Tuesday will be the Citizens' Night meeting of March 7th, 2023, the council agenda setting meeting of March 7th, 2023, and the regular council meeting of March 14th. 2023. Any questions or comments about those minutes? Hearing none, the reports of the tax collections. Any questions or comments about those items that we are considering for the month of April? Hearing none, 
list of bills and budget transfers. Council, any questions or comments? Hearing none. And the payroll report. Questions or comments? None. Thank you. Hearing none, we're going to move forward. Those items will be considered at <coughs> next Tuesday's April, April 11th council meeting at 7 p.m. <coughs> Bids and proposals in your white, the white part of the packet council, the 2023-2024 commodity bids. Mr. Little. Yes, we have the commodity bids, which we have each time this year. We have crack sealant, baseball infield mix, bituminous paving, fence materials, and uh, guide rail, reinforced concrete, wood safety surfacing material, sign material, small paving in place, crushed stone, Storm grates, frames, risers, and lids, and sewer pipe. Now, those items that are in shaded area are the low bid, okay, for each one of them. And we do have some that had no bids, and we have some that are just a loan <coughs> bid. And I would uh, stress to council to look at the loan bid, and if you're okay with that, then council can make a motion to approve all or approve them individually. Uh, for the loan bid, because if you if you want to, you could go out uh, to bid again because of the loan bid on each of the commodity. Mr. Hugus, I think you had a comment to make here. Yeah, I, I, the dynamics of commodity bids is going by the wayside, to be quite honest with you, because everybody is putting their products on state contracts right. mm -hmm. or county or shade cog contracts. So this may be the last year we do a commodity bids. In the past, we've kind of gotten the lowest bid with the commodity bids, but that's not really the case anymore. So I'll go through this real quick and, and help um, understand this a little bit. So the, the first part is the crack sealant, um, which shaded in, in, uh, in the gray. <coughs> I'm okay with awarding that, that specific bid. The bituminous paving material, um, the shaded area again is okay. <coughs> we only had one bid for asphalt, which is a product we use all the time. When we are prepping roads, we use a lot of asphalt material. And uh, the loan builder was Heidelberg. Um, no. And that what we're finding true. is is that these the other bidders, the other manufacturers are on state contract, and we're able to use them in lieu of using these, and it gives us some flexibility. Number one is if a plant's broke down, we're not pigeonholed into waiting. We can go to another plant to get the product, and we could go to a, go to a plant that we would prefer to use their product in lieu of using this product. So I would tell you that the, the, the line item for Heidelberg, you just not award that, and we could use a state contract. You talking about the crushed stone, Paul? Or the, or the, no, the bituminous paving material. On the second page. Well, oh, didn't our, right, our local okay. Uh, okay, all right. Asphalt plants even bid on it. As no. far as trust. No, and what we're finding here, I'm going to get through this a little bit. What we're finding is that some of these companies don't even want to put a commodity bid in. It's they don't. It's too much aggravation for them. They don't want to post a, a, a certified check to hold for a year. <laughs> you know, they just don't want to go through the aggravation anymore because they have all their prices on co-stores. Yeah, so they or statewide it. bid. So they don't even want to go through the commodity bid products anymore. So, like I said, this may be the last year we do this. We're going to do a little bit more research, but you know, some of these products I'm okay. We should we could do it, and the other ones we'll just use the state contract numbers. All right. Mm -hmm. So, the baseball infield mix. I'm sorry. The second page was the, the baseball infield mix. This is traditionally we never get a bid on that. This, the uh, third page is about two minutes paving. Again. I would not award the um, I would not award the bid to Heidelberg if they're a single bidder. It's something we can get off the state contract. Uh, the other the other products that are highlighted, which is cold patch, uh, it's something that we only get once or twice a year. Um, we can either pick it up or have it delivered. Those ones we could award with a highlighted one, but the Heidelberg materials, um, I would not award that. We can get that through the state contract. The next page, which is the fence material, 
the fencing material, I would I'll reward that that one um, items one through twenty one. Um, the next page um, is guide rail. And again, I'm okay with the guide rail. It's some part of it's furnished and installed. The other part is just the furnish of material. Um, and some what's interesting is some of these things were actually some of the prices came down dramatically. Some of the prices went up dramatically. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense. When we bid it last year, a lot of the prices were escalating. Some of those prices came down. Some of the other prices went up. Like when we get into signs, aluminum blanks, those actually have come down like 20%, but the hardware for the signs have gone up about 20%. So it, it's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Mm -hmm. um, the next page, which is the reinforced concrete, Items 1 through 18, we could board that. Next page is a wood safety surface from Jay Rudder. Jamie was just here. That's typically where we get our products from anyway. Um, the next page is the sign materials. Items 1 through 30. We're good. Um, sign hardware and post. We're okay. With 31 through 34. We're okay. Um, I would recommend we do not uh, uh, award the remaining 35 through 48 items because we can get that on the state contract. They are not highlighted. And that's so I would recommend 35 through 48 we not do. The next page is a small paving in place. That's a different animal. We could, uh, we could award that. Rarely ever use them, but we have them in case we need them. <coughs> Crushed stone, which is, again, it's Heidelberg. They sort of got the corner market on aggregate in our area, unfortunately. <coughs> I would recommend items 1 through 12. Um, the next page was the storm sword grades, frames, risers, lids. Again, the highlighted sections I would, I would award. And then the last page is sewer pipe. Again, the highlighted sections I would award. Those are the cliff notes. Great job. Council, any questions okay. for Mr. Hugis? Yeah. Paul, well, is there any reason on some of these that sh shows a highlighted area delivered and dumped? Is that something they do that, or is you request? A, a lot of times it depends on what we're getting. We'll have it either delivered to the public works facility or we'll go pick it up. So you ask for that then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Council, any other questions for Mr. Hugis? No. Any discussion about this item? Very good. We'll consider this at next Tuesday's April 11th meeting. Council, moving through our uh, agenda, we already tackled the two new business items. And moving over to our motions, we have three for this evening to be considered next week. Mr. Little. Yeah, first one is a motion to approve approximately $17,826.47 from the asset seizure fund. This is minus the trade in. This is for a uh, detective car right. that we have needed. A resolution was passed about 10 years ago, nine years ago, that this should be in front of council and approved. So that would be there for Tuesday. Any questions from council? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that resolution, that resolution is in your packet. Number two is a motion to accept the resignation of Anthony Pacusa from the Planning Commission effective immediately. And number three is a motion authorized to advertise an ordinance of Miss Pally Monroe repealing ordinances number 2464, 2480, 2550, 2690, and setting forth requirements for obtaining occupancy permits, transfers to transfer of one and two family dwelling units, establishing inspection requirements for multifamily dwellings, establishing procedures for obtaining said occupancy permits and setting fees for said permits. That was a mouthful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that something we don't have, or are we just kind of tightening this? No, up? that would just that's that's a uh, more or less a housekeeping item. Very good. Questions or comments, Council? 
Hearing none, we have three resolutions to consider. <clears throat> Okay, the first is a resolution exonerating the real estate tax collector from the collection of uncollected taxes in 2022. And this is another housekeeping item that uh, those taxes that weren't collected, uh, I believe Mr. Fulkerson has that highlighted on the resolution. And, uh, and I don't have the, uh, council can look and see what the number is. Um, Second one is a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into a traffic signal maintenance agreement with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation for signalized intersections in the municipality of Monroeville. And the third was a resolution adopting the Cambridge Square Apartments Clubhouse Sewage Planning Module. Those will all be for consideration on Tuesday. Thank you, Mr. Little. Questions or comments, Council? Hearing none, ordinances. We have one that was tabled from last month. Mr. Ratcher, if you would. An ordinance of the municipality of Monroeville, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, authorizing the municipality to enter into a land lease with Pittsburgh SMSA Limited Partnership doing business as Verizon Wireless pursuant to Section 501H of the Home Rule Charter for the lease of a 100 feet by 100 feet parcel of property and associated easements at the Monroeville Public Safety Training Center for the construction of a wireless communications tower and facility. And as the mayor said, this is on the table, so if you intend to act, act on it on uh, Tuesday, you'll have to take it off the table first. And uh, this is in yellow in the back, about three pages into it. I did prepare a short memorandum, just talks about the business terms to give you an idea of what the municipality's getting here in exchange for uh, giving this small parcel of land to, the, uh, uh, to Verizon. And um, uh, basically, it's, it's both cash payments on a monthly basis, and then we also have the right to put equipment on the tower, uh, which we would otherwise have to pay rent to some third party to do that. So cool. okay. it's actually a pretty good deal for the amount yeah. of land we're giving them, and, and we can enhance our uh, <clears throat> communication system. So if anybody has any questions now or um, obviously on Tuesday, <coughs> I'm happy to answer them. The one thing is it's called the it's called Restland Memorial Park, and that is because when these companies go out and try to locate where they're going to put a tower, they have these circles called search rings. And so their original search ring was in Restland Cemetery. And once they name those things, it takes an act of God to get them to change the name. <laughs> so that's, that's, We're not doing it says that. Restland Memorial Park, but it's in the Public Safety Training Center. Thank you for clarifying that, because I, I was wondering that when I was yeah. reading that information. Uh, any questions about the Ordinance Council? Mm -hmm. Is it all good now, Bob? I know we put it on the table because there's some things you Yeah, no, no, we, we worked everything out. Good. Yeah, everything's good. Okay. Yes. Great. And, Bob, uh, is this for a designated time or for the lease, or is it? Well, it's it's in five-year increments. Okay, and, that's and, what and I want to it's, yeah. it's for 25 years. That's what I want to know. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Very good. Moving over to our reports of municipal staff. Mr. Ratcher, you still have the floor if you would I, I like yield, it. I yield the floor to whomever. <laughs> Sounds good. Anybody. Mr. Little. Yeah, just two items. Jack said like Memorial Cleanup Day is Saturday, August 29th at 9 a.m. August? 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 April. Or April. Or April. What did I say? August. <laughs> April. Sorry. April. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah. August. Yeah. August. Yeah. August. Community August. Day Whoops. is day changed from late July to Saturday, June 10th. That's Community Day. And happy Easter to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Little. Mr. Hugus. I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rock. Nothing. Very good. Reports of our council members, Mr. Hizzy. Uh, two things, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the Parks and Recreation Department for a great Easter egg hunt and all the volunteers yeah. who come up and uh, helped us. And um, happy Easter to everybody. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Poach. Uh, yes, uh, the holiday season again. Happy Easter to to everyone, as well as I believe Passover starts tomorrow night, mm -hmm. and also Thursday. Bob, are you coming to the Eid, Eid al Fitr for the the what? Uh, the mosque? No, you probably not at the mosque uh, too. It's the end of Eid in end of Ramadan too. All happens the same time. One of the, like every so many years they all collide in the oh, same yeah. week too. So that's yeah. You okay? Yeah. Tomorrow night. I'll be up. Yeah, to do that. So uh, as well. So happy holidays to everyone. That's all for now. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, just wish everybody a safe and happy Easter. Thank you, Mr. Wolfram. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank all the people who spoke here tonight. They were very well 
informed, let's say, at least I hope they were. And uh, other than that, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Easter. Thank you. Mr. Adams. Yeah, happy Easter, everybody. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, again, uh, don't reprint this. Uh, everybody bring their copies back. Bob, you I are so conscientious. Gosh darn it. Thank right. you for reminding me. Bob. Okay. And uh, a shout out to our refuse collectors. Uh, residents are over the moon, the, the work that they do, and uh, they just do a good job. They're respectful. They clean uh, stuff up. I see them picking papers up that fell out, and they just do a great job. I want to thank them. I want to thank you for helping them. I'll out. pass it along to them. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and the only other thing is uh, Salt five coffee. Happy Easter. Eat lots of chocolate rabbits. No. Start with the ears. <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> We've Thank been here you. too long. Mr. Williams. Do, usually. <laughs> Mr. Biondo. Uh, yeah. Um, again, Parks and Rec did a great job with the uh, Easter egg hunt. Um, kids had a great time. Um, on that same note, the Parks and Rec spring guide is out. Um, I don't know if Jared has a um, copy of the flyer um, with the QR code on it. If not, uh, if not, it's out there. It's on the website. Um, there also will be one mailed uh, this year as well. Um, and also, uh, Mamma Mia is uh, oh, Gateway is presenting Mamma Mia yeah. this year. Um, it's April 27th, 28th, and the 29th uh, at 7:30. And the 29th also has a matinee show at two. Um, if you can go see it, um, support our kids at, uh, at Gateway. Question: Which one? One or two, Mamma Mia? I'm assuming it's the first, but I don't know that. <laughs> it would be. Uh, I, don't I believe it's the first. Yes. Uh, and uh, happy Easter to everyone. Happy holidays um, to anybody who's celebrating um, any other holiday. Um, and that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Ms. Biondo. And just, yeah, once again, thank you everybody for showing up this evening. And uh, we definitely have a lot of work to do with this uh, zoning ordinance. Mr. Wielden, excellent job uh, with everything, yes, getting it to this point and your presentation <coughs> this evening. And I know you've received a lot of uh, questions and comments from council members and staff and from residents. And uh, excellent job over the past uh, several months. And uh, Everyone's going to keep asking you questions, so uh, but we appreciate all your work. And Mr. Mr. Tr Mr. Yep, Mr. Trant, thank you so much for your work on this. Great job Very with the presentation. Great, great presentation. And, you know, there was a mention earlier about you know this process, and you know I I was an advocate, and this council was as far as bringing an outside uh, agency as well to look at it because really it's all hands on deck with this thing. So we had multiple planning commissions go through this. We had multiple employees and staff members go through this, bringing an outside uh, an outside consultant as well because it's such an important document. It hasn't been updated since the 1980s, and uh, we're still looking for the public's input as well to make sure we all get this right and we all work together and we keep pushing in the same direction. So uh, just a thank you to uh, everyone that came out tonight, and we will talk about this more in the coming <coughs> months. Happy Easter and happy Passover to everyone. And with that, I want to seek a motion to adjourn. Second. There's a second. I think so. All in favor? Aye. Uh, yes. This meeting is adjourned. Aye.